What's up, everybody? It's Monday morning. You know what time it is. Before we get into the episode, let's talk briefly about the sponsors that make this podcast possible. Today's episode is brought to you by Helix. Sleep, when I don't get good sleep, let me just tell you, it sucks. I fall apart as a human being. And there are plenty of reasons not to be able to sleep, whether it's politics, pandemics, love life, whatever it may be. I totally get it. Out of all those reasons, don't add a mattress to that. If you want an amazing mattress, the best mattress I've ever slept on, you need to check out Helix Sleep. They have a quiz that takes just two minutes and they are going to match you and your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Everybody is obviously unique and Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. Soft, medium, and firm. Mattresses for cooling if you sleep hot. And even a Helix Plus mattress for plus size folks. Both my daughter and I sleep on a Helix mattress. She Slept on my mattress, loved it, wanted to get one for her room, took the quiz. We both did, came up with different mattresses that we were paired to, and we are both loving the experience. So if you're looking for a new mattress, you take the quiz, you order the mattress that you've matched to, and the mattress comes right to your door, shipped for free. You don't ever have to go to a mattress store again. Helix is awesome, but you don't need to take my word or my daughter's word for it. Helix was awarded the number one overall mattress pick of 2020 and by GQ and Wired Magazine. Go to helixsleep.com slash cleared hot. Take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they're going to match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. They come with a 10-year warranty, and you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. They'll even pick it up if you don't love it. They're also offering $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows to the listeners of the podcast at helixsleep.com slash cleared hot. This episode is also brought to you by Element, the most delicious electrolyte drink mix that I've ever had designed to support active hydration and a healthy lifestyle. I actually just finished having one of these because I attended a jiu-jitsu seminar this weekend. Created by, co-created by, one of my good friends, Rob Wolf, arguably the smartest person that I know. Element has enough sodium, potassium, and magnesium to get you feeling and performing at your best. Plus, it has zero sugar, artificial ingredients, or other junk that you're not going to want to consume. Now, when it comes to performance, or if we're speaking of performance... Some of the best performers in the world are using Element. I'm talking about Team USA weightlifting, NBA teams, NFL teams, the Navy SEALs, like I've said before, maybe don't use that as an example, but let's just say special operations, and the list goes on and on and on. Element can expand your limits too. If you want more energy while you are having a low-carb dieting phase or intermittent fasting, if you want to crush your next workout, or how about your next workday? Element has the electrolytes to make this happen. Eight delicious flavors. You're guaranteed to find one that's going to suit your taste buds. Watermelon salt is one of the newest ones, but they just came out with the grapefruit as well. It is lights out delicious. They also have a classic flavor combo pack, so you really can just pick and choose what it is that you want. Go to drinklmnt.com slash cleared hot and use the promo code cleared hot. If what I'm talking about sounds of interest to you. Last thing, Element might have the best return policy on the planet. If you don't love it, You'll be instantly refunded. This episode is also brought to you by Feels. Now, when it comes to CBD, it's not about what you feel. It's about what you don't feel, specifically stress, anxiety, and pain. I personally have used CBD and specifically the Feels product for all three of those, sometimes in combination. Feels is a better way to feel better. Go to feels.com slash cleared hot and you'll get 50% off your first order with free shipping. Feels is a premium CBD that will help you keep your head clear and feel your best. It's hassle-free delivered directly to your door. CBD naturally helps reduce stress, anxiety, pain, and sleeplessness. There's also no hangover or potential for addiction. It's very simple. You place a few drops of Feels under your tongue, and you're going to feel the difference within a few minutes. The thing to remember about CBD is that finding the right dose is important, and it varies. I recommend their Flight, which comes in three different doses. And if you're new, Feels offers a free CBD hotline to help guide your personal experience that you can use and find the perfect dose. Joining the Feels monthly membership makes your self-care very easy. You'll save money on every order, and you can pause or cancel at any time. So start feeling better with Feels. Become a member today at feels.com slash cleared hot, and you'll get 50% off of your first order with free shipping. That is F-E-A-L-S dot com slash cleared hot to become a member and get 50% off automatically taken off your first order with free shipping. Feels.com slash cleared hot. Last but not least, this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. H-E-L-P. If there is something that is interfering with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving whatever goals you may have, 
BetterHelp is here to assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can start communicating with this individual in under 48 hours, but you need to understand that this is not a crisis line and it's not self-help. This is professional counseling that is done securely online. BetterHelp offers a broad range of expertise available, which may not be locally available in many areas, and the service is available for clients worldwide because it's internet-based. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counselor, and you're going to get a timely and thoughtful response. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions so you can avoid waiting rooms if those make you uncomfortable. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they're going to make it easy and free for you to change counselors if needed. In my own personal experience, it has taken me a while to find somebody that I really connect with. Don't give up on the process. Continue down that path and just find that person that you can connect with and then do the work. And by that, I mean you're going to do the work. They're going to facilitate it. BetterHelp is more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. You can visit their website and read their testimonials that are posted daily at betterhelp.com slash reviews. Visit betterhelp.com slash cleared hot. That is better H E L P dot com slash cleared hot and join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Special offer for the listeners 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash cleared hot. And that is all on the business side of the house. My guest today is Kelsey Sharon, and she is a force to be reckoned with. She is a Canadian Forces veteran who, on a deployment to Afghanistan as an artillery gunner, had what I'm going to call a very intense experience. I'm not going to get into that because she does. And she also talks about the severe effects of those experiences. It did not ruin her life. It certainly set it on a different path, but what she's been able to do has been quite simply amazing. She's on a mission to change the world and to heal the people who have helped defend our freedom. She's got a podcast called Brass in Unity. Actually, she has many things under that umbrella. She has a jewelry and accessory business. She has her book, the podcast, all titled Brass in Unity. Very smart. I'm going to shut up now and let Kelsey speak for herself. Episode number 189 with Kelsey Sharon. Here we go. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Come on, win it, man. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. I mean, that's a solvable problem. It, it's a solvable problem for people like you. I consider myself to be pretty damn average and normal, so why is it not a solvable problem for you? Because I work in the fashion industry. Uh, I've and seen you, pictures you, of fashion people with no hair. Have you seen what I look like with no hair? I mean, I'm I'm willing to explore this route. I don't, I don't I'll know cut that you, it for you. You don't want to do that. It'll be traumatizing for you. It won't be. Well, I feel like you would enjoy it too much first off as well. And I got so. my master's in fashion, so don't even go down Shut that Shut the route. fuck up, really? No. Okay, well, then no, that's I what I thought. I barely graduated high school. Okay, well, that's why you're a Navy <laughs> SEAL. <laughs> I am not a Navy SEAL. Well, I was at one time long, long ago. Okay, so you are not a Navy SEAL, but you are... That, that, see, that I don't understand that. That's something I'll never understand. It's always going to be a part of you. It's always going to be a main base of you. It's like, before that, we're not going to say high school was your fucking base you were a navy seal that's your base like but it doesn't have to be the main base no it doesn't have to be the main base but you haven't told me other things yet so i need to learn fair um i actually i try to step away from it as as often as possible i i know that because it's happened to me countless times where you get introduced or you're in a social social circle it comes up rapidly yeah not from me um and for better or worse it is what it is right it's like it's like the fucking shiny object in the room. Yeah, and I but here's the thing. I don't enjoy that aspect. I would much prefer that people just like, "Oh yeah, hey, we hung out with Andy and it was just Andy." Not, "Hey, Andy, really? the guy who used to be a Navy SEAL." Yeah, it's it's not I'm not enamored with it. I'm super glad that I did it. I'm very proud of my service. I'm exceptionally thankful for the people that I served with. Right. But I would like to have like 3 or 4 times as much time out of the military than I did in and I'd rather just be Andy. How long were you in for? 17 years. One okay. month shy of 17 years. Okay. So you had, that was a big subset of your life anyway, right off the, the gap. The vast majority of my adult life, very formative years from 18 all the way to 
run the numbers on that. 35. I wish Mike Glover was here. He's my quantitative. Well, he's Asian. he could have been here. You could have left the Asian here. I would have supported it. <sighs> he's really good at math. I know, well, they're Asian. They should be. Yeah, he actually sucks at it. I caught him in the podcast is it because he's Is it because he's Korean now and not Japanese? <sighs> I feel like they're all good at math. Oh, okay. God, we're going to get in a lot of trouble for the things that we say on I this. live I in Vancouver, like... so <laughs> welcome to the fucking show, Andy. So earlier you said... It was something around touching, after this talk comment about touching sweaty dudes, which we can ignore that comment. Sweaty dudes. You like sweaty dudes. It's okay. Just let it out. Let it be a part of you. You know what? There's one I of your things, like Andy. I don't like sweaty dudes. But, but here's the thing. You must. You have to have some aspect of you that likes sweaty dudes because you wouldn't continually, conti- continuously sweat with dudes. And How then, are you supposed to get better at protecting yourself? Well, it's, I'm not saying that there's a better option. I'm saying, and I'm not trying to say there is. I'm just mm. saying you like sweaty dudes. It's okay. Just let it out. I like some sweaty dudes. Okay, so then that's fine. So that's a part of you now. So now we go, this is Andy. He likes sweaty dudes and not a Navy SEAL. How's that? Does that feel better? I'm fine with that. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's... I'm going to introduce you like, oh, so when I force you to come on my show, I'm going to introduce you as Andy the sweaty dude liker and not a Navy SEAL. That's good. I okay. might have a future in gay porn if we I, go this route. I would like to be somehow on the sidelines of this to say I influenced some of this. Nobody wants to be on the sidelines of that. Kind of now, though. <laughs> I mean, you did it to yourself. You True. It up. You said all rangers and seals are the same. What are you talking about? I mean, you're all the same in the sense of um, the soft guys. So, like, I'm Canadian. So, think of it this way. We have JTF2. I could yep. group them in. I had a guy on from JTF2. Really? When? Jeff Depetit. Uh, oh, he's French. A month Poor and a half soul. Ago. Poor soul. Or he said, I could, he said because I'm American, I oh. could say Depatty. I was like, I'm not going to say that. That's embarrassing. Depatit. I'm like, I can okay. figure out one word, probably. After no I comment. practice it. After I practice it on repeat in the mirror for yeah. six to seven hours. Yeah. How do you say it again? Let me record you saying it and we'll get back to that and then in six let's months. Listen. Yeah. And yeah. let's listen to it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's uh, yeah. So like the J, what I mean by that is I group it in a sense of like elite human beings. So for me being um, a re- like an NCO mm-hmm. to, to, to look at the way the military is structured within Canada and the US and the rest of the world, whether it's, you know, um, people like Dean Stott who are British and you've got those kind of like Royal Marines and all that. You guys are all soft guys to me. I know there's different branches. I yeah. understand that there's different that's ins fair, and outs, an but you're all like an umbrella of elite people. So that's that's what I mean by that. I don't mean like, cause I know, I know, I know the rules. There's Rangers, mm-hmm. there's Navy SEALs. These guys are super gay. These guys aren't gay. They're all awesome. Oh, okay. All special operations is awesome, but we have to be cautious saying that they're all elite because there are some fucking idiots shit in special pumps. operations. Yeah. Just like there are. Would you say shit pumps? Yeah. You don't call them that? I, I'm i not saying the soft guys. In the military in let Canada. Let me tell you right now, I'm going to start putting that in my vocabulary immediately. You've never heard that before? That's the first time I've oh ever heard I feel shit like pumps I'm, used. Shit pumps is like a regular thing we used in the NCOs. Okay. Like in Canadian military artillery, for us there was we had a handful of ship pumps in like one gun unit, so it was just it, it's its own disaster. I'd say I was going to write that down, but I don't need to because no. I will probably use that later today, maybe with one of my kids. Okay, well I'll be disappointed if you don't. I so. will. I'm, that's going in the vocabulary okay. immediately. Well, I'm glad that I could be a value add to your life. Yeah. See. See, here's the thing though. I can spot what branch generally the special operations guys come from. Based on. Uh, team guys I can spot a mile away <laughs> off of their, in general. Is this mine? Sorry to yeah, interrupt. Yeah, that's yours. Fresh, freshest Montana tap water Thank you've you. ever had. I've never been to Montana, so Perfect. it's my only Montana tap I'm not going to say that's out of a spring. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> so. I'll take your word for it. So team guys, mm-hmm. <clears throat> generally, mm-hmm. flip-flops. Yeah. Board shorts. Guaranteed. Baggy shirt. Uh-huh. Gator sunglasses. I was. <laughs> Sunto or G-Shock watch. Yeah. Hat on backwards, backwards, some version of an American flag, but like sweated out. So like you're wearing right now a baggy t-shirt with board shorts and flip flops and I'm a wearing backwards hat. I'm shorts, which are like really serious mountaineering things because oh. I might go mountaineering later. So today. here's the thing. I know of them because they just won a CAFO award. They're Canadian. Or yeah, at that's least, correct. Yeah, and the so company my, that owns them is. Yeah, Arct- yeah, Arcteric. They just won uh, a design award this year in Canada for CAFO. It's uh, Canadian art and fashion. We were nominated for one this year. That's the only reason I know. But my husband knows the design dude. He's a design hmm. dude. I don't know. So rangers, yeah, running shoes, yeah, because S- always have to be running. Socks that are like three, not ankle socks, slightly up to the calf, like BMX, like like mountain bike guy socks. No, it's not like quite. half calf. Oh, half calf? That's mm-hmm. a bit low. The shortest shorts you've ever seen. Because I got to show the quads. 
No, I don't know exactly what piece of equipment they're twi- trying to highlight. It could be <laughs> north or south of the quads, but it's just super short. Uh, regulation haircut, Always. generally. Um Probably some type of T-shirt that has a gun or an ammo or 1776 or grunt or fuck you if you don't love America type thing. <laughs> you can you can pick those guys out pretty easy. What else? Uh, yeah, I mean those are the two I can kind of pick off, but they're di- okay. they're different. Okay, it's uh, they're all the, the many they're all in the same menu. Okay, but they're different flavors. Okay, so <laughs> maybe it's like Baskin Robbins because you've tasted them all, right? Sure, if we want to talk about it. Well, you went terms. there. That yeah. was you went yeah. there. Like I said, I'm I'm pitching for this job in Cape Horn. So. I you've you've <laughs> nailed it. You don't need to pitch. You are just an immediate success. You could. You know how quick if you. P- <laughs> I don't even know. If I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not actually going to do that, people. So I don't need any suggestions in either my email or DMs about this. So. <laughs> well, I hope you DM him like hard, hard, fast. Pun intended. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. How was your travel from Canada? How are things up in Canada? Right Canada is run by a bunch of communists right now. It's really bad. So we're recording this the 25th of June, just for Correct. reference. I've heard rumors okay. that the border may open back up. Yeah. So here's the kicker. Um, so we live on the border. Like, and I mean, like we get the border runners that run through the backyard. Kind of like on the that fucking, close to the oh border. on the border yeah okay. and so the the way that the Canadian government has kind of set it up right now is it was supposed to be on the twenty first of this month and so we it was also supposed to be many like other last, days and many other months. like last yeah. year yeah exactly right so what happened was um, in order to cross the border you're supposed to get paperwork saying that you're going down for business or some type of essential service. So we're like, okay, well, we we were told it's opening on the 21st. And they're like, well, just bring paperwork just in case. So my husband and I drive down two and a half seconds from our house. We pull up and I give him like a stack of paperwork like for his company, for my company. Like he he pays U.S. taxes. We pay U.S. taxes. I donate to U.S. fucking people. He has U.S. employees. We're considered essential or we thought. And then we had a gentleman tell us that we were not um, that our business doesn't matter, uh, that they don't give a fuck if we've done COVID tests. It's it's absolutely useless to them, but they're not we're, we're not allowed. Was this just this one individual's discretion or is no, this so, policy? No, it's it, it's right now it's policy. Okay. And so it's supposed to be changing. I believe what was the I think it was the 20 uh, I just read it online. 11th or like the 20th of next month or something. They push July. it. July. Yeah, exactly. July. So what had happened, though, it, what we found out was somebody leaked it to the press that it was opening on the 21st of June. That person lied. And now that person is being sought after by the RCMP, which are the federal police in Canada, because so many people are coming and the immigration issues that are coming from it right now. Yeah. It's just astronomical. So this gentleman took our paperwork and just is like, go into secondary. So we go into secondary. We're sitting there and I'm just sitting there. I'm just going, we're not getting fucking through. This. Is this an American gentleman or a Canadian? American. OK. And so he takes the papers. I'm going to give it to chief. And I was like, well, we just had a lot of things happen in Canada. You probably should stop saying the word chief. Just tossing it out there for sake. <laughs> just sake and um so he goes and he talks to the guy and the guy goes well you guys have a flight book tonight right from vancouver and we said yeah and he goes tell him not today tell him to fly hmm. i was like what the f- what do you mean not today i provided all the information you're not deemed essential so we pay u.s taxes nope not essential not essential to the u.s okay so all the 5013 c's i've donated half a million dollars to and their veterans they're not essential fantastic thank you for that so then we turned around got in the car picked up my mom she drove us to the airport and then we took off from Vancouver and we landed uh, we went from Vancouver to Seattle so the whole point of us not flying was because we had to stop in Seattle no matter what we did we live two hours from Seattle might as well drive it makes so much more sense plus you don't have to stay in the Nazi hotel for three days when you get home so that's a whole thing we're trying to avoid so what we did then is we're like okay we get on the flight we go down to Seattle we sit in Seattle for a day we hang out with uh, Griff from Combat Flip Flops mm-hmm. he lets us stay there over the night and then we take off the next morning from Seattle and go to Wyoming and then we're there for a day and then we came here yesterday and then we're here until tonight and then we leave tomorrow for San Diego yep. then we're in San Diego until Monday night and then we go up to LA for some other podcasts and then some uh, business stuff we got to do and then we go back on Friday and then they'll put you in a hotel for three days no so here's the kicker we figured out a loophole <laughs> I've done this before. I did this in January when I went down to do ayahuasca. Okay. So the loophole is you can walk across the border and you don't have to stay in the hotel. Why? Because they're stupid. I mean, it honestly, it just sounds like a government program. Oh, it is. It's an, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it just screams government to it, me. It couldn't be worse and it couldn't be more obvious for people like us, for a civilian population and the rest of Canada who is just like... Our people are proud to be in our country. We we are we love Canada. We we you know 
I'm, I, I scream it from the rooftops that I'm from there. I'm not embarrassed of it at all. But there is this this is one point in history where I could not be more ashamed, disappointed, and just disgusted with our like our civilian population. There's no pushback. They do not give a flying fuck. Like for yeah. example, last night, and if I'm not mistaken, it was Montreal beat out Las Vegas. I think in like the Stanley Cup. I don't follow hockey, so just go with me here. Mm-hmm. Um, and inside, is that legal for you not to follow hockey as a Canadian? I'm gonna find out. Okay. Yeah. Um, I thought like you were raised with a hockey stick in your hand. I was raised on dirt bikes in the woods. With a hockey stick? No hockey sticks okay. allowed in my house. And still in our house now with our son, there's no hockey sticks allowed. All right. Uh, he doesn't need concussions like it's that. It's a changing of the guard. Right. Something like that. <laughs> we'll call it that. And so I'm West Coast Canada, so I'm like barely Canadian at this point. Um, so what had happened was they they were like, you know, we're gonna um, we're gonna let everybody go to the hockey game. Small amounts of people, social distance with masks. But then when you go outside, they had a massive, uh, what's it called? You know, those, uh, like a green screen so that everybody else in the like town can watch the game just like they did in like Vancouver. Like a jumbotron. Something like that, along those lines. They just kind of projected it. And projector, there it is. Yeah. And so um, what happened was they allowed everybody, fucking everyone in Montreal to stand side by side with no masks and watch this. And there was no issue with that, but you couldn't go in the building and do it. You can't be side by side and do it. But you also can't open your businesses. Oh, and Kelsey, and all 200 retailers that you've lost over COVID that you're trying to get back is just not happening. Why? Because they're all buying Chinese jewelry that's $20 and sunglasses that are $20. So they've taken it to the point where Amazon across the street from me can stay open. Walmart can stay open. But my company has to shut down for fucking God knows how long. And then all of my retailers that are all independent, hardworking people that I've single-handedly knocked on doors and got over the past five years, gone. Wiped yeah. off the face of the fucking earth. And then they go, here's your tax bill. We're raising it 56%. Good luck. 56%? The town of Surrey in British Columbia, I'm fucking calling you out because it is so bad. They raised our rent. Um, first off, they we had lease, time to do our lease. So they fucked us and they said, we're going to raise that 50%, deal with it or get out. And we're attached to the Irk Covert Facility training place for SWAT. Mm-hmm. And then um, they go, oh, here's also your tax bill. It's up 56%. So when are you guys moving to the United States? Well, here's the kicker. We have a house in California. Yeah, when are you going to move there full time? <laughs> Actually, tax-wise, tax wise may is not, not the place. be the best also. <laughs> it's not the place to go right now for taxes either. You know that. So we Wyoming has 0% tax. I You should move there. Bishop gave me the rundown. We got the we, I'm, For we clarity, got the I have no idea what the tax rate is. Apparently, I've just been told that I can't tell people to move to Montana anymore. Um, that or Texas, because apparently Joe's just fucking up that world yeah. down there. Well, in Montana, we're at risk of volcanoes, so you shouldn't move here. But aren't you guys at risk of volcanoes like everywhere around here? Like nope. if Yellowstone blows, isn't it just going to wipe out? Just only Montana is what I've been told. That's what the science <laughs> says. You have to follow the science. <laughs> <laughs> that legitimately almost went out my nose. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Would have just ruined everything for you. Yeah, but it's um, Montana's beautiful. We've only seen... Like the hotel. Yeah. And well, what you were describing, though, the main businesses, and by main, I mean very large um, corporations like Walmart and Target, yeah. when everything was locked down. And what, what I will say is there probably couldn't have been a better place to weather the COVID time period yeah. because it did shut down for a while. There was a legitimate everybody stay the fuck home, but it didn't last as long at all mm-hmm. um, as other places. And I don't know if that's because people who are from here have a little bit more of a, hey, I'm gonna do what I feel is right Mm -hmm. type of um, ideology. Um, But I also think that the mandates, whether it be mask or stay home, they just seem to be shorter. But when it was locked down, Mm -hmm. Target stayed open, Walmart stayed open, but the main street that that I met you on, I saw- On the corner, you picked me up on the street corner there. Hey, you you can agree, it's easier to to meet there than here in the studio. He, He said specifically, Kelsey, can you meet me on the street corner? And I was like, which corner? By the karate studio. So Something like like that. Yeah. I watched uh, brick and mortar small businesses close. Yep. And if you walk up and down Main Street, North South, you'll see cavernous spaces. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how they'll they'll be refilled. They won't. I, I would never, never do a retail space on that Main Street again, especially with the uncertainty going forward and how yep. knee jerk it was with the reactions and being told, hey, this is all shut off. I would never do it. We don't, ha- here's the thing about us. We don't have a retail location. We sell to wholesale. So we don't have a retail location. I'm an online-based business now. Yeah, but if the retail locations close and they don't have a storefront, it's still going to affect you. Oh, no, it fucked me sideways. So this is why I'm not doing it anymore. I only work with big box. So I I sell to the Marine Corps Exchange. 
which we have in the top five bases in the United States. So we sell we sell to like Henderson, Pendleton, uh, Miramar, Quantico, and one other one. Okay. And then so we sell our products there. And then we're right now we're um, we just signed with AFES. So for their locations, so we're working with them. Armed Forces Exchange system or something like that. It's Army and Air Force Exchange or some. Yeah, Yeah. but they have twenty seven hundred locations. But we're starting with them online only, which is the ideal situation because if they get shut down again, we're not going to run into that with them. We ran into that with um, in Canada with Canex, which is like the same thing, but on all the Canadian bases. Yep. So we had two test locations set up in Ontario, and it got hit the hardest. So they've been shut down since they've signed with us. So they're selling, you can get Canex mm. online, which so you can order the products and it'll come from their warehouse. But in terms of their brick and mortar, it's just, you're not even allowed in. And the, and the kicker is if they do let you in, they take um, this like uh, painter sheets of plastic and they put it over stuff you can't buy. Yeah, I'm not into that. So in Ontario, and this doesn't affect you because man, um, female, you couldn't buy kids' clothes, kids' books, shoes, tampons, female hygiene products, or anything. But it could be open, but they would block it off. And if you tried to buy it, they wouldn't let you leave the store with it. Why? You tell me. I can't. Exactly. It sounds fucking stupid. You're, you're preaching to the choir, my friend. Yeah, I'll be interested to see. I, I mean, assume mm-hmm. that everything will open at some point you know and what sucks is i actually love going up to canada it's the border is 60 miles as the crow flies north yeah you guys are really close i didn't yeah. really there's snowboarding horrible. up in fernie yep. i've driven through banff oh my god it's yep. unbelievable i would love to go back and be able to do that but it might as well be the north side of the himalayas right now it is yeah Yeah, because they'll just turn me back it's like an hour to get to the border and then the it's just gorgeous as soon as you get across and yeah. i used to start my hunting season in northern alberta well that makes sense there's tons of hunting up there yeah Three years in a row, though. Or yeah. Actually, no, this will be the second year that I wasn't able to go because of that. And I don't know how the outfitters are, and the guiding services are going to survive either because they need non-citizens because if you're a citizen of Canada, you don't need a guide. That's you can right. Go, you can go hunt. So, That's right. Yeah, it sucks. It's uh, I've been talking with my buddies. We want to go do uh, – we have dual sport uh, motorcycles, and we want to go do a ride through Banff. It's like, mm-hmm. well, cool, maybe 2023. 20, you know, like good luck. Let's put it on the calendar uh, three years from now, so maybe there's a good chance. If it'll Trudeau's out, you might have an opportunity. But if he's not, you're probably going to be sitting in the same position. How long can he stay? Well, he's got up to. So there was the. Listen, I, I said this on the last podcast I just did because I'm not very politically educated, but I do know something. So I'll mm-hmm. talk about the things I do know. But I'm very careful because if I don't know it, I'll tell you I don't fucking know it and I'll fix it because I'm. I do a lot of that. Um, so with Canada, I know because of COVID, there was supposed to be an election. He got an extension. So it was supposed to be four years, but I think it's five years now. I don't know, but this fuckhead needs to go. Can he do a max of two four-year terms, though, similar uh, to the U.S.? Oh, I don't know. I want to say yes, but I'm not 100%. That's a huh. good question. I should know that. I know more about your stuff, I think, than I know about mine. Ours is easy. You well, can, you know. It's shoved down your throat. Yeah. Well, you know, the maximum is two by four, and then see you later. Yeah. Yeah, so. I think it's similar. I know um, his dad was in, and his dad did the same thing. That the, like mine is COVID. He did the same thing in the country. It was just it's issues. Just uh, those are solvable issues. They're gener- I mean, <laughs> sure it takes are. time. People think if you just vote one person out, which is, you know, kind of happened in the in the U.S. Right? Like right. we have to get rid of Trump, and we have to bring uh, Biden in. And I think a lot of people were just basically saying we have to bring somebody other than Trump in. And I don't give a shit politically. People can believe what they want. Right. But if they think that the day that one leaves, at, that somebody else comes in, that there's going to be some drastic sweeping change and you're a different country. You're out of your mind. We're still the same fuckheads. Yeah. You know, and, and arguing that's, over the same stuff. And I said that too recently. I said, you know, the thing that I find really fascinating is up in Canada, we've been very recently divided. As before, we were just not quite as divided in the same sense that the way you guys were. You guys were left and you guys were right. And we watched the elections and we, I remember falling asleep the, the night right before the election got called for Trump and I woke up and my husband was like Trump won I was like shut the fuck up I'm no he didn't because nobody yeah. but in Canada we were all just like enthralled with what was going on down here and so you had that divide almost immediately with us we just recently started having that divide and it's been over vaccines and so with you guys it's the thing that I, ne- I never quite understood is you're always going to piss one side off there is no it seems like there's no happy medium with you guys it's one or the other and if you don't like it then you're going to be pissed off and if you like it you're going to be happy i just 
it's just sad to see because I don't know that it needs to be like that because there really can be a middle ground, I believe. I think there has to be a middle ground and a willingness for people on both sides to work together for it to actually work. Right. I think if it stays divided the way that it is, I mean, I couldn't put a timeline or an estimate on it, but I think that's the long-term road to it, the system itself destroying itself. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's what it looks like from the outside for as little information as I have. Yeah. It's what it looks like to me from the inside as well, too, but I'm by far uh, not a political expert. Well, by, fair enough. Well, neither of us are. I'm glad that we've clarified that up for yes. everyone. But you are a new, like, emerging gay porn star, though. Not yet, but I'm, you know, peeking around the industry to see if there's opportunities. 2022? <sighs> Q3, Q4. Okay. All yeah, right. Later fine. in the year. I'm not going to just dive in head first. You know what I mean? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> How was your experience with ayahuasca? It was uh, life changing and life saving. Why did you go? I went because I was incredibly suicidal. Was that the first time you had been that way? I mean, no. it, okay. Well, um, obviously, we'll get into yeah. uh, the military service. Were you suicidal or did you ever have suicidal ideations pre military service? No. Probably post traumatic stress. Oh related, yeah, no, I was no, I was um yeah, I got fucked up in Afghanistan and mm -hmm. then I got medically released in 2011 on a three B med release. Mm -hmm. Told I would never work again. Okay, no, I, I mean I was just trying. I know some people who yep. have said they've had suicidal ideations earlier in life. Oh, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so it was post your military service. Yep. I've had quite a few friends now. I'm going to say probably close to a dozen who have gone down, and it's either uh, ayahuasca or IB game, and then the five DMT yeah. or five MEO DMT that, yep. that follows up afterwards. I believe. Um, I only know of one person who it didn't have a life changing impact, really and effect for. Yeah, he ended up taking his life. Actually, Sorry to hear that. yeah, um, because from what I have heard from people. Uh, let's say you go down there for substance abuse. Alcohol would be a great one that has its hooks deep yeah. into at least one. I mean, I'm dated at this point. I've been out of the military for almost eight years. The community that I came out of mm -hmm. and the community that raised me in those formative years, the consumption of alcohol, it had, it had its hooks deep. Like at a doctrinal level, they'd be like, be responsible. Yeah. Don't drink and drive. Also on the same uh, cork board, kegger on Friday. Right. So yeah. <laughs> it's like- You're not going to oh, win that. Hey, new guy. Um, every- Friday, you owe us 20 bucks for the beer fund. It's like, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, so you said, let's, I've had a few friends who go for alcohol consumption. Yep. And it's not that they don't ever drink again, but they have a different relationship with alcohol. Exactly. And a couple of them have said, I don't ever want to drink again. And some of them have said, I enjoy drinking, but I'm going to do it on my terms and probably not for six months or a year. So it, what I mean by all that is the impact is long lasting. It is. For my friend who uh, ended up killing himself, uh, and I'm not intimately familiar with the details, but I do know that he had, had explored those treatments multiple times, mm -hmm. but would relapse very rapidly. Really? So yeah, I mean, I've heard great things about it. And I, and I actually, the reason I asked you about it is mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by people's experience with that. Mm -hmm. um, but I also hear some people saying, hey, it's it's like this magic recipe, which it just doesn't exist. It's not a, here's the thing. I don't think it's a magic recipe. I think you have to be at a point in your life and in your recovery or in your healing where you, you're you serious. Yeah. You gotta be, you gotta want it. It's the same with like wanting to kick drugs or alcohol. You gotta fucking want it. And I was at the point for me where I had, I so I've been out for a while. I've been out since 2011, May mm -hmm. 23rd, 2011, and I deployed in 2009. And so it took those couple of years of them trying to like retrain you and drug you up till you're like you know can't walk, and we'll yeah. just say you're great. Anyway, so for me, it's been quite a quite a time now. But um, for the first, I'd say six years afterward, I was like, oh, I was so bad. Six years post military post service. Post military, I was so bad. I. The, I wasn't sleeping, I was angry, I was fucking violent, I was, uh, I, I didn't ever get into drugs or alcohol, that was never like a crutch for me that, mm -hmm. I, that I I was gravitated towards. I have alcoholism in my family, so I tried to stay away from it for yeah. that part. I, I'm, I'm fairly lucky on that stance, because I know it's, it's a very slippery slope for a lot of vets, very slippery. And so, what really was the catalyst point in, in kind of pulling me out of the depression and like staying in bed all day and the sleeping all day and the just literally staring at the wall and crying my fucking eyes out was my doctor, Dr. Greg Passy in, in um, British Columbia. He's one of the leading uh, forefront doctors in PTSD research in Canada. And this guy is like an old vet who served in Rwanda and in Bosnia. And he's a medic. He was there in the genocide. And now he's like a retired colonel or something along those lines. He, 
we don't talk about it. He just yells at me. And um, he kind of just said to me, you know, I think it's time that we try something different. Exposure therapy is not really working for you. And if you know anything about Canada, I live in a place where in Surrey, British Columbia, it is a predominantly immigration immigrant population of Pakistani, Iraqi, Afghanistani, Indian. And so there's a lot of burqas and there's mm -hmm. a lot of those types of things. And for me, what I went through, it was just not a great scene for me to be around on a regular basis. Visually reminded constantly. Straight up attacked a family in a Walmart in Ottawa. How did that go? Well, my mom was there, so that was cute. Thank God. Proud moment for her, I'm uh, sure. I, <laughs> she's had a few lately. <laughs> Um, but it was, I was, uh, I was getting like toilet paper for a new house and I was there and I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. It was September and this guy looked at me and his wife was in like full screen Yeah. and kids were, you know, in their full guard and they just looked and he fucking looked me up and down and it just, it set me off like in a way I can't describe. And I went at him and I started grabbing things off the shelf and I just started calling him all kinds of, you can imagine the colorful names that were coming out of my mouth in general. I think public. I can. Oh, they're good. And so she grabbed me and physically removed me from the store and just kind of walked away and didn't go back in to kind of address the situation at all because it yeah. was probably safer. And so my doctor was like, let's try art therapy. I'm like, that's fucking stupid. I'm not doing that. You're mm -hmm. not gonna get me to do that. If you know anything about me, I'm a fighter. I do extreme sports. I'm outside. I'm not doing that. And so he's like, just try it. Give it a go. See what happens. So I got a pipe cutter. My husband got me a pipe cutter, like a handheld pipe cutter mm -hmm. and a drill and um, a couple bits and a hammer. And then I called up some friends that I served with that are now snipers. And I was like, hey, you know, the casings you're not supposed to give me from the range. Can I have some? And they're like, not like all of them, but like a couple. But like the 50 cows and like the 338 Lapuas I shouldn't have in possession of mine as a civilian. Those sucker. Well, why can't you have those? Because in Canada, you can't have shit. Yeah, but it's just a, it's a spent casing. Doesn't matter. Let me tell you a story why. Okay. So they showed up at my door. Oh, Jesus. Here it gets better. They show up the casing, show up the door. We we're happy to be down in California. And um, we moved to a brand new cul de sac. Beautiful house, dream house. Like. What city in Cali? Uh, it's in Valencia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I had to think there because he used to race uh, Supercross. So he was down in Minifee there for a while. So I, my brain. Um, so anyway, I get it. It's there. We're at the house, California. My mother-in-law pulls up to the house and she goes, there's cops at your door. I said, give him the phone. So she gives the phone to the cops. There's a cop at the end of the cul-de-sac blocking it off with a squad car. Another guy's got a fucking gun in his hand and he's going up to my door. Right. And he's got another one like standing there with his hand on his gun. And I'm like, if I was there, this situation would have went so goddamn sideways, it's not even funny. Just from a trigger standpoint, like you're at my new house in my new safe environment, which I'm just getting handles on the sounds and where I am and who's doing what, moving around. And you're going to come to a vet store who you know is a vet because you were called by the MPs to go check, to find out where she's getting these 50 cal casings from. So somebody, as I started building jewelry, I started getting less and less suicidal. So like I would get out of bed. I had, hmm. I had a reason to get out of bed. So I would start building jewelry and I would sit there in my pajamas for like eight hours straight. I would not brush my teeth. I would not fucking move. I would sit there and he would come home. My husband, I'm pointing at him. Sorry, he's over there. And um, I just didn't cry that day for the first day. And then I just started eating slowly. And then I was like, I want to go for a run. And then I just started getting my way through this. And so I need more casings. I need more casings. So people started buying them and going, hey, where can I get these? And so I started approaching retailers and doing those types of things, right? So they come to the door, he gets on the phone, and I said, what can I do for you? He goes, we've been called from Ottawa by the military police because somebody bought a piece of your jewelry and it's got a 50 cal casing on it. And I said, first off, I know what piece you're talking about because I'm just new and so I know where the orders are going. I'm yeah. fucking paying attention. It's literally the cutoff end piece of the casing. Yeah, no longer usable. No, not even remotely close. And he goes, you can't have those. And I said, who the fuck are you to tell me what I can and cannot have? Is there an actual law in Canada that says you can't have those? <sighs> it, there's a, it's gray. Okay. Um, gray is fun when it comes to interpretation. It's a fantastic thing. So they said, you know, do you have any more ammunition on you? And I said, if you check my records, I don't even have a gun license. So no, I don't have guns in my house. So I can see you on my cameras. So you can either put your like guns away because that's unacceptable or you can leave. He goes, well, where are you? I said, I'm not in the country. And you don't need to know where I am because guess what? I'm not your fucking property anymore. And I've been out for five years. Therefore, I'm past the statute. So get off my property. And so they're like, okay, we'll call the MPs back and we'll let them know that you're not like a threat. And I'm like, 
you have my medical records that say what the fuck happened to me and you still thought that was a smart decision to walk up the door that way and you wonder why people are getting shot in their back up like way north in bc because you send helicopters after them when they're having a like family dispute and it's a veteran who's severe ptsd like we had a guy shot like right before that hmm. just because he cops showed up at his door and it wasn't just cops it was like the earth team showed up all black fucking lab or is like SWAT team yeah yeah okay. it's, yeah, it's the emergency response team same okay. thing and so they showed up at the door they sent helicopters over he ran to a shed he got fucking panicked it was a whole thing yeah. the only reason I know about it is because my doctor was his doctor yeah what do you think it was about the art that made such a difference for you I think it was my hands doing something again just occupied and mm -hmm. creating yeah for me I've never really been that creative individual I just enjoyed blowing things up and being busy and being very busy and so I would volunteer I would do the extra things I would whatever I, I would be doing something all the time and then when that stopped and they ripped me away from my unit and my security and what I thought I was and who I was and what I was doing and the way they did it I lost everything in a blink of an eye and yeah. for me that just sent me over the edge yeah it sounds like um, I was going through your book it sounds like you had the intention to stay in the military Absolutely. in your career field for as long as they would have you I love my job yeah yeah well I mean, let's work our way there. I'm assuming when you grew up, though, you probably didn't have aspirations to join the military. Didn't have any family members in the military. I found out while I was writing that book that my grandfather served in World War II. That's awesome. Like, but I didn't have a clue my whole life. So where did the desire come from? I met an old lady on a bus. Like a legit old lady? Like a legit, like served in World War II with an Air Force uniform and a row full of medals on November 11th in 2007. Why was she wearing that uniform? It was... Remembrance Day, Veterans Day. Okay. Yeah, and so I go to ceremonies. I love I love history. Yep. I love war history. I love the the idea of it. I I just I always you always have even yes. before service. Yes. Okay. Loved history in general. Different different types of history, but for me, World War II was always that kind of one that I really did enjoy. I know that sounds really fucked up to say because nobody should enjoy it, but there's a nostalgia. I know what you're saying. You're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So. Um, I was in uh, university, well, college because I wasn't smart enough to get a four-year school. And so I went to college in Ottawa and I went, took the bus down to just like the ceremony because that's our capital of Canada. And so they have a huge, huge ceremony. I was taking the bus back and this lady just had this kind of air about her. You know, when you see somebody, you're like, yep. you're fucking cool. Don't know why, but I'm going to ask you. Also, your outfit's legit. Well, the there was that really ties it all together it, it, it ties it all together exactly it was a very obvious ominous thing of her sitting in the corner um but i went over and talked to her and she just kind of told me very little i served i did this i did that and then we just i realized i'd missed my stop and then so i got off and i went back and i i'm i'm no exaggeration i walked right into the next class i had and said i'm fucking out of here just based off that one conversation alone i i, I, I couldn't be I can't describe to you how much that woman had an impact. I was supposed to meet her at that time for whatever reason. Was it what she said or how she held herself or that air about her or all of those things that had I think that it was how she held herself in that air. It wasn't so much what she said. She said, you know, she served that she flew and that she gave me very little details. She could tell there was like uncomfortableness about mm -hmm. re kind of going back into that. And that day obviously was probably hard enough for her as is. And I couldn't quite understand to the level that it, how difficult it would have been until now I, I grasp it. Yeah, different optic. Of course. And so for her, that kind of conversation, she was willing to just chat with me and sit with me. And I was just so thankful for that. And so I left and I told him I was out and um, I found out where there was like a recruiting office and I just walked in. So you walked in with the concept of wanting to be in the military. Did you have an idea of what you wanted to do? Anything front lines. Anything front lines? Didn't care. Jesus Christ, what kind of conversation did you have with this fucking woman? You got to understand something. I, um, I'm What year is this, by the way? This is 2007. Okay, so post 9-11, you knew what you were getting into. Yeah, I knew what was going on. Yeah. I was like legitimate. I was 11 or 12 when 9-11 happened. I was at school. I fucking remember it. I watched the towers go down. I, I knew I understood mm -hmm. very early on something was wrong. I didn't obviously couldn't grasp to the extent. I don't think anybody could have unless you were in and knew what was going on in the country and what was, you know, the, the fuck around of all of it. But I knew something was going on. But from like that age to when I went to college, there was no talk of it. There was no where I lived. There was no you should join the military or you should be a cop or you should go serve or you should. But none of nothing. Small town, graduating class of 100 people, a couple stoplights, farm town, hockey town, 
just lived in the woods like there was no talk of like go join the military we didn't have people in canada we don't have like people coming to the high school being like you should join the marines like we don't we don't do that or at least we didn't where i'm from i don't think they do that here either i've seen it at high schools i think military people can come on base i don't know if they allow military recruiters at the actual high school is the parking lot i've seen it in I think they might, um, uh, but this is like this is like yeah, like way you're talking. Like I saw a guy in uniform one time when I was in high school, but that's because he was a graduate from the year before mm. and chose. And now I, thinking back now, this dude was in his class A Marine Corps uniform. Okay, there was absolutely no reason for him to be wearing it when he came back to visit his social studies teacher. <laughs> And now I look back, I'm like, what the fuck were you doing, man? He was like, feeling good about himself. He was, and he wanted other people to feel good about him as well. Oh, so it was that. I think. Okay. I'm going to judge this individual. Okay, well, you're judging. It's <laughs> yeah. okay. We've we've now established that you're a porn I'm not star ju- and I'm you're not a judging judger. anymore. I'm okay. done with judging. Oh, okay. It was just sure. th- that moment that I just judged that oh. man. Okay. Well, I'll hold you to it. Don't wear your fucking class A's to a high school social studies class just to say hi to your old teacher. Like- it's a little weird. Or do, but do it around Andy so that he can just rip you to shreds because that's hilarious. If you did it around current Andy, I might have comments. Well, I 17 like... year old Andy, I was like, this is weird, but I'm not saying shit because that dude's in the military. Exactly. Because that dude's <laughs> in the fucking military, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So now I went and I, um, they just said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to blow things up. And they're like, cool. So you were their dream recruit. I was the I was the definition of thirsty bitch for that military job. I liked the idea of it. I never hunted. I never shot a gun before. Nothing. So do you have the contact information for this woman? Because she needs a job I think at the recruiter's office. I think, I think, unfortunately, she's probably passed on. That sucks because in a bus ride, yeah. she took someone who had no exposure no and clue. then got them to walk into a military recruiter's office and say, I want to blow shit up on the front lines. I love blowing things up. Yeah, who doesn't? It's I know. awesome. I know, but people who have never done it before, they can't They can't understand. You should just do it. I mean, do it in like a safe space and like, like not to people. firecrackers or what do they call that shit that rednecks get? It's a uh, tannerite. Sorry? Do you guys get that stuff up there? No. You can buy this stuff at like Cabela's here. It's uh, sorry, what? You can buy high explosives at just like a Cabela's. It's not high explosive. It's enough though. I may have blown a car up with it. So what you're saying is you stack. It's just kind of like anything else. You stack a few of them together. No, they only come in small individual sizes that you would never combine into a bucket. <laughs> you would always combine into a bucket. And then put pressure on it to well it that's your own fault and i don't feel bad no, they about sell that, that stuff uh tannerite yeah okay it, you, uh it's actually reactive to bullets a lot of people will shoot at it and then it makes that big blast go. correct okay fair enough i'll give you that so with that she said what do you think you want to do and i said what oh, i was a female recruiter as well yes and air force though i didn't okay. know that at the time but now i understand why she had a blue shirt okay. under the greens and so she said there's artillery armored and infantry what do you want I said, I want infantry. They said, you're too small. And I said, you haven't even given me the fucking chance yet. And they said, you're five foot. And at the time I was 103 pounds. And that's too small? Were they talking height or weight? Both. I mean, I served with some SEALs who I think were under five feet tall. Shut the fuck up. Yeah. There's a guy named Josh Bridges who is four foot six. What? Yeah. I'm not actually sure if he's four foot six, but, oh, but I, he tower, just looks... I tower down. Okay. So, but I'm He's wearing... a little midget bitch. Okay. Okay. Who's well, awesome, by the way. I okay. actually love you, Josh. But I, now I want to meet the midget bitch because I feel like we should stand together. In you like a you would look over him. Well, that's what I. That's the point. Yeah, you would look down upon I need, him. I need that. Have you ever seen Lord of the Rings? No. You know it's about like hobbits. Though, yeah, right? like tiny. Like we people. <laughs> it's Josh Bridges. <laughs> You're a horrible person. I'm not. I'm just. It's a metaphor that a lot of people understand. Okay, fair. I'll take yeah, it. It's just a hobbit. Okay, um, and so they said no. Just right off the get. They're like, you're not doing that. We're not going to try to even try and train you because then you'll VR out and then we're going to have to deal with you and God knows whatever else you're going to remuster to. I said, okay, let's do artillery. They're like, okay, cool. I was like, what are we shooting right now? They're like, well, you're going to practice on the 105. The round's about 40 pounds. You should be fine with that. And I was like, howitzer, no big deal. Yeah, it's fine. And then they're like, but you're going to deploy with an M777, which is a 155 millimeter howitzer where the round goes up to your hip and it weighs as much as you, but you're going to chuck those around. But we won't let you do infantry, but we'll let you do that. Also sounds to me like you're describing a government system. So at this point, everything actually makes sense to me. It, good. I'm so glad that yeah. you're understanding. I don't have to explain to you. You no, get it. I grew up in the military. It's like, yeah, yeah, okay. The, so there's no sensical route to what we're taking, and no. this is just what we're going to do. Got it. Yeah, I'm used to this. <laughs> exactly. 
exactly. Yeah, I want to speak. Yeah, well, yeah, my husband's it. a civilian, so I tried to explain it to him, and he gets it now. Like, he fully, he's been with me since I got home from overseas, so he gets it. But Jesus Christ, there is something when you say no infantry, but sure artillery. The, you should have said armored. I would have been a perfect driver. I, I'm that would have been sweet. I've driven a tank one time. Just one? Just, well, <clears throat> it may have been based off how I drove it when they let me drive it. But oh, I got, you're a shit driver. Or I like donuts. You know, it's hard to say. What were you driving? Uh, I think it was an N1 Abrams. Okay, so with tracks, that's an American run, right? So you guys have yeah. tracks on those ones? Yeah. Okay. All so tanks have to have tracks, don't no, they? No, they don't. Canada has a lab that has big old fuck off. That's not a tank. Okay, but it counts. It runs as a tank. It acts like a it tank. It actually doesn't. There's nothing about a lab that is even remotely like a tank. So the turret? That's just the like a cal? little pea shooter. It's oh. 50 cal. That's fine. Oh, okay. We have two on our tanks. Okay. What? We're what else not you got? all cool like you. <laughs> Keep your attitude to yourself. <laughs> Fucking hell. God. And I flew I like, down here for this I shit. I like labs. Okay. But labs are not tanks. No, they're not. Okay. They're more like Bradley fighting vehicles. Fair, fair enough. That's how we were using them whereas tanks. Yeah. So you drove them like an asshole and did the tracks come off? No. Okay. So They then... let me behind the wheel one time, gave me at least 20 seconds of instruction. And then when <laughs> I was- It's perfect amount. Yeah. And then when they were done, the guy was like, hey, we're not doing that again. <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. I might have screwed over a lot of other people who wanted to drive this. I did it I once. just had a fucking good time. Thank you. High five. That's right. That's yeah, all I that's need. That's all it was. I didn't hit anything. I just really explored the turning radius. You explored the turning radius. <laughs> okay. And were you were you in the States when you did it? I was not. Okay. So, and you and I both know that's your fucking fault and you should have 100%. known better. Yeah. Okay, good. That's fine. Like I said, I got my chance to drive. Other people wanted to and did not. Okay. It sucks to suck. It, no comment. Yeah. So, yeah, those things are great, but- um, I'm kind of glad I didn't end up driving one of those because the unit I would end up deploying with, we end up having a driver, a female driver, go. Yeah, actually in Afghanistan, let's see. Oh, yeah, the IED threat, even when you first got into the military, was skyrocketing. Right. Not the place to be. No, it wasn't. Yeah. Exactly. So to be in a FOB would be ideal. I was cool with that. Yeah. Yeah, the, the choice job. between the two, I, w I would stay on the FOB as well, yep. as opposed to driving around in armored vehicles in the most heavily mined country on the face of the earth. Correct. And so... Once they said, okay, you can go artillery, they said, just sign these papers, and then um, we'll call you when we have, like, a boot camp date for you. They called me two weeks later. Is that fast or short for them? Very fucking fast. Okay. They called me two weeks later. They're going to swear in, and then you're going to report to Saint-Jean, uh, like, the 4th of January, so 2008. So then I did Saint-Jean, so you're training your 12-week boot camp. Mm -hmm. Then I went and got posted to... Gagetown, New Brunswick, so far, far east, far, far east, and then like five, like an hour later in time than New York, because I've been to a place. Yes, I've yes, been to a place yes. in Canada so far east that it was one time zone yes. beyond New York. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're one. Yeah, you're even go for. Yeah, yep. there's even more. If you, believe it or not, you can go all the way to Nova Scotia, and it's even like more time. I will remember that, but never experience that. Okay, well, that's probably your choice yes you know what Nova Scotia is really nice you go to the ends of Canada here and here fucking beautiful yeah kind of come in I love BC and the, yeah but then you get the middle and it gets yeah. the I spent actually a good amount a couple months in uh, Vancouver in the city uh, outskirts ish okay do a TV project Ooh. I wasn't not on the I was on the side of the camera that doesn't record so what you're saying is you're the big deal that was in Vancouver just just doing film stuff no I was legitimately at craft services most of the time <laughs> Well, because they have good craft services. Goddamn like right they do. We do. That's where the chocolate-covered almonds were, and I was mowing those fuckers down. So that, way, that was your place. We, we could just find you there at all times. I would check in, be like, yeah, you guys seem to have this. I'll be at craft services. Fair enough. Or crafty, if you will. Okay. Did you work on six? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll tell you a story about that after. Okay. Because um, I can't say it yet. Okay. So... So anyway, I, I got to New Brunswick, and that's where I did a DP1 and SQ. So, I do not know what those mean. Okay, so uh, DP1 is uh, your weapons training. C7, C8s, machine guns, grenades, Carl G, all the fun stuff. Get certified on This the, is after boot camp? Or yeah, you, okay. after boot camp. Boot camp's 12 weeks. Okay. So you can do that. Then if you're lucky, there'll be a course running, and you can hop right onto yeah, it. As opposed to the hurry up and wait philosophy. I had none of that going on. That's atypical, at least in the U.S. military. It's like yes. you call ass through a course and it's like, ooh, you just missed it. But there's another course in 18 months. So yeah, is it like on that. pad or something and you guys just sit there? and? 
Well, it depends. That's when you learn how to mop really well. Yes. You learn how to like scrub and chip paint. Yes. Yeah, really great utilization. Do you do, do, you do the brass uh, fittings on the floor? Do you guys have to polish those? With the Brasso? Yeah. I have I've done some Brasso polishing. Okay, in my good. Day. So it's not just me? No. Okay. I think it's everybody in the military who is not gainfully employed at the moment. <laughs> Good. Good. So then I did after that, I went uh, right to a next course, right over to the artillery course. Awesome. Yeah. Well, in New Brunswick as well. In New Brunswick as well, because we can shoot live fire there. And they did they start you off on the 105s and then bump yes. you to the 155s? Well, yeah. So the 105s happen for all training. So you do the, you learn the, sorry, I keep like looking down and stuff because I'm thinking because it's been so long. Um, you do, you do your like first two weeks of class stuff where you're going to learning about your, mm -hmm. explo you know, all that lovely jazz and all the classroom boringness and then they bring you out to the field but when they did that to me though um we had done a ruck march before that and it was a poorly planned ruck march it was one of those hey we're gonna fuck with you wake you up you're not gonna be ready put your shit out and let we're gonna go yep and so that was fine so we did that and um but the difference is i went to and they're like okay hurry up we're gonna go shower really quickly and then we're going out to the field and we're like okay no problem take my boots off the whole bottom of my foot went with it like the layers of skin just oh, from like the top of my heels all the way down to about almost to the balls of my feet just fucking came right off of my socks and I was like double socking and I was like I fucking taped my feet like I was a fighter I know how to tape my ankles and my feet I do it properly how long was the ruck? Uh, we did I think a 13k with like I think it was like 60 pounds yeah but so I, it's like 7 and change mm -hmm. and so I set pace though because I'm the shortest I would have set a really really slow pace so I that's the kicker though we had we were getting ready to do like the last amount of training so we had to do like the the ruck in the certain amount the fire team carry all that so it was like set pace and instead of like walking we're going to airborne shuffle yeah and so we're going to put at the time my maiden name is burns so we're going to put burns at the front and then we're going to let her set pace and so at the time i was in like a bajillion times better shape than i am even now i think i'm in decent shape now but i was like fucking ripped like best shape of my life and so like i would set pace and i would push myself kind of situation and that would people hated you just so you know a lot yeah i had no problem with that because there was a lot of people in the back like who in the fuck is and they're the tall right people now? too that are just fat and lazy and i've got no issue saying that if you can't carry your weight you don't belong in my unit I actually that's fair i just I, if i'm gonna deploy with you and you're gonna pull that shit then i don't want to be with you you're not gonna get an argument from me on that shit pumps Chip pumps for sure. There it is. Yeah. So uh, they they kind of said, okay, well, we're going to recourse you. And I was like, well. Because of the injury to your Because of feet. my feet, oh, yeah. Shit. So they sent me the, um, was it not MRI, the um, fucking medic place. What do you guys call it? You call it something. Corman? Yeah, something like that, but we call it something different. I don't know what it's called. It was French. I don't know. Uh, what do we call it? Yeah, we just call it going to medical. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have like a name. I don't remember. But um, so anyway, I went there and they're like, I had an incredible uh, lieutenant. She was dialed her name is lieutenant labonte she was a major when she retired i think she's out now and she works with the soft community in petawawa and she's i wrote about her because she was like there's not a lot of women in that job mm -hmm. and when you meet one that's like holy shit you can pull your weight i want to be just like you and so she was like i'm not going to get you recourse i'm going to try to let them wear you <laughs> you're going to try to wear flip-flops on the on the gun line we're going to see if they let you do it and they let me do it <laughs> so i ran <laughs> I ran flip-flops while running the 105s so I could stay on course. And then they eventually let me switch to running shoes and then back in the boots. And then right before we went out and did training, like, and did, like, our tack movements and stuff where we were, like, back of the truck, jump down, okay, move quick, quick, fire, fire, back up, load, and go. Before we did that, I just got back in the boots. So I was You happy. should be able to fight in flip-flops. I don't see why not. I have been in a gunfight in flip-flops before. But I feel like... Y that's the difference, though. You can be in gunfights in flip flops. We were at our outstation. We were getting mortared. Okay. And like the first round started impacting. I was sleeping at the time. I had shorts, shower sandals on. Yep. Grabbed a machine gun <clears throat> on the way. Because <laughs> you have to have something. Yeah. And then just had started having people bring me ammo and was just mowing shit down with wearing <laughs> flip flops. Yes. T shirt, shorts shower sandals but the soft guys can get away with that shit if we ran out of time to fucking put shoes on okay but here's the thing it doesn't matter if we had fucking time to put shoes on or not we're ncos we get yelled at for that shit yeah Where's i mean to be honest fucking well gear? had i showed up at a training evolution in flip-flops i would have had my ass handed to me yeah. overseas when we were 100 plus miles away from the nearest american force yeah 
it's going to be okay. Well, they just needed somebody in the goddamn watchtower. Fair enough, and I'll give yeah. you that, and I respect that, but uh, it depends on your unit, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was. I had my ponytail high too high once. Really? Overseas. Yeah. Yep. I had extremely long hair when I was overseas most of the time. I could see that. Yeah, like three to four years without cutting it. Oh. Yeah. What were you going for, the Muppet look? I was going for, I'm in the military and I have the chance to not cut my hair look. Oh, did you, sh yeah, and you didn't shave overseas either, right? You guys run the beards, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you were living like the dream life. Uh, it actually became more of an irritation than anything because God help you on a summertime rotation when you have the ZZ Top's hair, you know, or really? just like. Uh, I, don't, I don't, I don't know what that's like at all. Yeah. No, not I, me. I don't know if it got that long. I actually had to get a haircut because. People were mistaking you for women from no. behind? No, uh, I was on a helicopter trying to shoot, and my hair, hair was, was hitting in your my face. Eyes. <laughs> I was like, "This is fucking gone too far." Oh. I'm getting my hair cut. <laughs> oh, there's so many things about that that I love. I can't even describe because I've been, I've been there where it's just been. Yeah, you're like, like I wish I didn't have this. I'm like, God damn it, my sight picture sucks. And I take a second, I'm like, mm. it's my own hair. That's embarrassing. We've gone too far. We've gone too. Far. This, like, I didn't know how far too far was. You found it. And I found it. You found the line. And I got a haircut. Okay, good. Did you cut it all the way off? God, no. You just did a trim. Trim. Oh, so you didn't cut it. Yeah, you like a little, it. I mean, I feathered it in a little bit. I'm not just going to roll it. Like a bowl cut. No. Because you guys have to look like a certain way, right? We don't have to look like any way. We're not all the same prior to what you actually potentially think. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. No, I just feathered it in. It was glorious. I had bangs. Did you amazing. feather it with, like, did you bring, like, good scissors? Did you uh, use medic to, scissors? We don't have to talk about the army guy that cut my hair. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we'll just see him in your upcoming release of your gay porn video. I mean, he might be behind the camera. You never know. Or behind you. You never it's know. Possible. I don't think so, though. I don't know. I don't know. I'm gonna have to do some research on I this feel industry. Like I see. I see like the wheels turning <laughs> while we're talking, and that's why I'm laughing because I'm like, this is there's turning there. Yeah. It's good. Okay. I mean. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Okay. All right. Is there a camera view on YouTube to oh, people yeah. to see this? Because yeah. I feel like it's they need to. Okay. They, yeah. Okay. Uh, here's the thing, though. I'm not that complex. Mm. People, I think, generally see directly through me and see what I'm seeing because it's – I'm generally thinking, like, at the lowest common denominator. Okay. Like, what's the simplest thing I could be thinking about? That's it. Just a little bit simpler. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That's why people resonate with you. Maybe. I'm not sure why, to be honest. <laughs> I'm not sure why at all. It could be your aspirations for gay porn. Those are going to be new and revelatory for people. So okay. we'll see. The viewership might tank after this episode. Oh, well, fuck. That wouldn't be I'm first. willing to see what happens, though. Oh, Let's okay. just, we're, just, we're going to do it live. There's no editing. It's okay. fine. It's okay. I don't edit anyway. <laughs> I prefer to let everybody see everything so then they question everything about you. Perfect. Mm -hmm. It's great. One. Okay. So yep. back to the howitzers, though. Yep. You're post flip flops, which is good. Post flip flops. And uh, so, um, let me see, you joined 07, you said? Mm -hmm. So is this, are we in 08 yet? Yeah, we're in training? 08, we're, we're finishing training. Okay. And then uh, we did, we did the, we did the firing, we got the, we came from a private to a gunner, we did that all that, we had a guy ND around, while wow, there was foo underneath it. That, that was, stands for negligent discharge, everyone. Yeah, his first artillery round, he fucking ND'd, and there was foo underneath it moving, and it was live. What's foo? Forward observation officers. Okay. They're the artillery that are attached with the infantry. Damn. I've seen people N D like handheld rifles and pistols. Uh-huh. Uh how it's their N D is gonna that's a tough one to be like, what was that? He graduated. Did anybody hear that? He he graduated. <laughs> well, I mean, hopefully your mistakes can be recoverable. Uh but that's 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 a pretty big one. You can tell yourself whatever you need to right now. I'm I've made plenty of mistakes in my life. I'd like the chance for redemption. If he didn't kill anybody, perhaps he learned a mistake. This gentleman should never have made it to course anyway. Well, that's a different issue. That, that's what I mean. Yeah. It was like a, almost something that we we kind of expected. Like this guy was just... Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's anyway. a different issue. So the ND then was the expression of him Correct. being incompetent. Yes. Yeah. Then that person should be removed. Right. I've seen some very highly competent people too. I wouldn't call myself highly competent, but I've certainly made some mistakes. I've been around highly competent people. It happens. Uh, sure. For sure it happens. Yeah. Absolutely. And I yeah. think that's where there's a different conversation though. For sure. Now the yeah. person you're talking about, it sounds like probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. Uh, yep. And in that case- Military wise, that's their chance to rubber stamp and actually do something about it. But right. when they graduate him, you lose that opportunity. Right. It's tough. Yeah, and then he got posted out. So then we finished and we were on graduation class and we were on um, parade. And then we had a, a sergeant and a RSM from Vacchiazzi. So 
Quebec came who spoke like no English and was like, you, 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 and you, you're all posted and you're deploying in April with us. Posted means assigned to a unit? Yeah, we got okay. assigned to, so we graduated like being in the military, all your basic training and all of that lovely jazz and your trades training. And then we were getting posted to our first, our very first posting that we would be doing whatever we were gonna do with. Which sounds like an almost immediate deployment on top of that. It was, we deployed in the following April. Wow. Yeah. To? To Afghanistan with a unit that didn't speak English and I didn't speak French and either did the other guys. Oh yeah, we're definitely talking government at this point. Yeah, it's a good time. God, I got so much fucking hair. It's Where in Afghanistan? Uh, I'm. Uh, we landed in Kandahar yep. at CAF, like most do, unless they're people like you. Um, I've flown in and out of CAF. Did you? Yeah. Maybe. When? What year? Uh, I flew out of CAF in 2010, flew into CAF in 2010. We would be down there all the time. Really? Yeah. It would I depend. A lot of times, uh, so when I was at the East Coast Command, there would often be uh, some personnel that we had reasons to kind of bounce all over the place. Okay. But Bagram often. Yep. But, you know, anywhere that had, a, had an airfield big enough to take the airplanes. Yeah. Because you guys had, like, because the way, I don't know, like, for most people, if, obviously your listeners are all predominantly, I think, military or military esque. I don't know. No? You should look into that. I, it, I've tried. Oh, really? Getting the actual um, like da that the, demographic, the and demographic stuff? and the data of yep. the information on people who listen is really hard. Okay, I can get age sometimes and yep. uh, geographic location, but I don't know anything about them. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Okay. So when for if they don't know, so like it, the way that CAF is kind of split up, there's American side, there's a Canadian side, there's a British side, and everybody else is kind of mixed in, and so we. We flew, um, so we deployed with them, and when I got to that deployment, they, and I mean no English, like yes, no toaster, like bad. And there was five of us that walked in, and I was the only female. <laughs> the other guys went to all the other troops, and then I walked up to my sergeant, and he fucking looked at me, looked me up and down, and went, Carlos, fuck. I get her? And I was like, you get me! And so, I'm excited too. Nice to meet you. It's so great to meet you. Thank you. And so I was the female on that gun, the only one. Um, and then we ended up deploying with them. They said, you're going to learn French. Yeah, you're just going to learn French. And I was like, cool, how? And they're like, you're just going to learn. And I was like, okay. They're yeah, like, we're you're just going to basically only speak French around you and you'll start picking it up. That's how I learned. Yeah. And so, but here's the kicker. I got to be the um, the RWS, the remote weapon system for our T-Lav. That was me. So I had to go learn that course in French. Oh, shit. Like, right away. So I went to a course uh, with the Van Dus, over to the Van Dus side. In country, you're going through this course? No, this was, uh, I did a mortar course in country. Okay. I'm an artillery gunner. I did a mortar course in country. Hmm. Okay. So I go and I do the courses. Anyway, we get ready. We deploy. We deploy. They're going, okay. Uh, I think it was Ch Bravo Charlie, you're going to Massam Guard and like one other Canadian base, which is much bigger. I don't remember exactly which one it was. And then Alpha, you guys are actually gonna go up to Fob Ramrod. You're gonna stay with the Americans. We're just gonna leave you there. Cause you're gonna replace a reserve unit that was there. I was like, this is gonna be awesome because at least it's a small fob mm -hmm. and it's like super tiny. I think it was like three kilometers around yeah. at the time and you're going to just fire support for them. I'm like, okay, that's great. And we were hearing that there was tons of fighting going in that area. So we were thrilled. Yeah, we weren't going to be busy. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about artillery or those types of jobs, if you're not shooting, it's busy work and working out and busy work and working out. And that's fine. I can do all of that. But we were told we were going to fire a lot. So I was excited about going. I was yeah. thrilled. So we finally got there. We got into country and they're like, you're going to do three days uh, a calf and, um, just kind of get yourself, we're going to go over what's going on in the country, you know, all that kind of stuff. What kind of ideas. In brief, if you will. Yeah, sure. You guys call them something cool. I forget everything. So we did that. And then we, we get on the uh, Chinooks and we go out. <clears throat> we land and um, the units were ripping out. They're leaving. And instead of being like, here's where you're going to live. They're like, let's hang a noose off the top of your tent when you walk in. And that's going to be your welcome. Seriously? Yeah, so there was a new tech. I have a picture of it. The first fucking day we got there, we walked to the Canadian side. And because the Americans have like three quarters of that fob, we had the like corner, fuck, I don't even know how big it was, maybe like a kilometer. And we had two guns there. And then we had all our ammo there. And then we had our tents. But we didn't, there was like a line in the sand, <clears throat> like legitimately. The, the Americans didn't really come across and we didn't really go over there. And that's just how it was for a while. They kind of started to. Once, yeah, I was going to say, that's weird. They didn't speak English. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, and okay. all, a lot of those guys were from Texas. They had a. Um, they don't really speak English either, no, though. No, so. I learned that. 
um, Texas, Alabama. We got I got a lot of Southern people on that deployment, and they had the um, I sound like a, such a fucking asshole. The one, you know, the number one, the yeah. patches. What's that? What's the, what are the, what are those that unit called? I don't know. Like the 101st or something? Uh, that's the Screaming Eagles. That Is that would, what they are? The 101st Airborne. I actually don't There's... know. I'm not an expert when it comes to the the flare pieces that military units will wear. Yeah, I just I just know I recognize them, like that unit from okay. like that one they used to wear all the time that was always on their patches. It was just like a number one. And so we were with them and uh, we, they're like, you know, you're going to secure your own area. That's your OP post. That's on you guys. Figure it the fuck out. Just leave us alone. And so I got on the OP the first night. And I, observation post sorry I got on the tower the, and it was a four hour and it was the middle of the night and I look and I'm like there's no NVGs here and they're like yeah no 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 you don't have any and we're like no they're like okay you guys didn't deploy with night vision no so we didn't we didn't I didn't know mm -mm, bare minimum so when we got that's there that's below bare minimum yeah mm -hmm. so then we had to go ask our staff members for like our staff members our like fucking sergeants and all that for like a pair like that we, you would share in the observation post. And they would it, stay there. Holy shit. Yeah. So when we got there, though, um, I did a radio check on the radio. But I forgot, and I did it in French. So like, contrôlez de vous. And then they're like, uh, <clears throat> tower, <laughs> you coming in real again with that? I uh, didn't catch any of that. And I was like, oh, yeah, radio check over. And they're like, is there always going to be an English person here? And I said, nope, none mm -hmm. of them speak English. There's like two other officers that speak English. One's a female. She probably won't talk to you because she's always busy. And then the other one, no. Oh, shit. So there was this weird kind of strain. Hold on a second. And you were there to provide fire support uh -huh. that was probably going to be called for in English. Oh, fuck. You're tracking. Yeah, we're definitely talking about the military. See, see, <laughs> see, you're getting it now. You're getting it. So yeah, we, we were there at the FOB, but then it was at the beginning of June. They got a call um, into the tent and they're like, uh, cause we have like these, these like green tents that mm -hmm. hold cots. And then the guys that were Called there. GP tents. Is that what you guys? General purpose. Okay, cool. So we had four of those and then we had an extra one for like food. And we had all the, we had all the Gucci food. Like the Americans weren't allowed soda because they kept passing out outside the wire because they were dehydrated. That unit mm -hmm. did. And so they weren't allowed to have soda. So then I met a couple people and then I started trading Oakley's for cans of Coke. That's a good deal. Oh, it was fucking awesome. Yeah. I loved it so much. And so when they got a call that I wasn't going to stay, that she got picked to go with the British. Interesting. So I got borrowed. Okay. So you know how like you guys sometimes take females with you once in a while? Yeah. Okay. Same. But at the the difference was my sergeant at the time, Sergeant LeBlanc, who's actually deployed right now in Africa, he's with the British and he's now he's switched sides to an officer, so he knows how I feel about that. And um he was like, uh, you're not going. There's no way you're going on that. And I was like, I'm I'm a hundred and fifty percent going. I'm bored as shit. We haven't fired that much. I I'm one hundred percent going. They said they went through all the females that were the options and they landed on you. And I was like, okay, cool, let's let's do this. And he's like, okay, well, I'm gonna keep fighting it. We're gonna start getting you ready and like tacking you out because you have fucking nothing and you have no light on your rifle. It's not even zeroed. You have nothing. And so- How was your rifle not zeroed? <laughs> because they didn't give us time to zero them. You need to make time for that. We didn't get a choice. Okay. Yeah. It's always a good idea to go into country with a zeroed rifle. Generally. Always. Okay. Yeah, there's no generally about that. Right? One. That's what I thought. <laughs> and then when you find out that that's not how they think, that's a different thing. Fuck. So anyway, yeah, so we went and they're like, you're going to go. And so he fought it tooth and nail. And then he comes over to me one day. He goes, come to my tent. And I was like, okay. So I go to his tent. He just starts stripping his shit because he used to be infantry. He's deployed. He knows. He's been to Bosnia. He's done the whole thing. He's mm -hmm. been to Africa. He just starts giving me everything. I'm not even kidding. He's throwing mags at me. He's like, you're going to need all of these. Every single one. Carry them all. I know it's going to be heavy. I don't care. Fucking carry them. And this guy, Sergeant LeBlanc, he like took me under his wing and kind of and people say, well, it's because you were a female. It's like, he had daughters. Yeah. I He just, he kind of respected me on a different level because when he asked me to do something, I fucking did it. Whether it was physical, psychological, whatever, I did it. I didn't question it and I did it well because I, I was good at one thing in my life. First it was fighting and then it was this. I was mouthy and I was loud and I was annoying, but I fucking could do my job well. And, I, and, and nobody could tell me otherwise because I knew how to do it and I was confident in that ability. So... 
he's throwing shit at me. He's like, I'm gonna take you to the little range we have. We're gonna zero some shit. And I was like, okay, great. Cause that would be ideal. He takes off, like we deploy with these chunky old fucking um, sites that are just for, for any close combat, absolute garbage absolute garbage that you're you're gonna miss everything you aim at and so he's like he takes his off he slips it on mine he puts some lights on he's got this going he's getting all this next thing you know he's fucking popping grenades in here and i'm looking at the grenades and i'm going those pins are gonna get caught on something i know it i can feel it i'm freaking out for whatever reason it just made me panic and i was like i'm just gonna duct tape on the little pins there it's like you're a bitch that's embarrassing and i was like i feel good leave me alone no you should always duct tape the pin and you put a rubber band thank on you screen. okay no I, I did that and people gave me shit for it like yeah that's because they're idiots okay thank you and it also means they've never thrown a fucking grenade in oh my life. god you're getting it he's getting it yes he's yeah, getting it. that's like day one shit oh my god yes so i did that because i was like this doesn't feel right and so they they fill my vest and I'm fully ready to rock. And then we get a call and they're like, um, the Chinook was taking fire. It had to turn around. It couldn't pick you up. So if they don't come tomorrow morning, you're not going. Oh, and, damn. And so now I'm pissed off because like I'm in the mindset that I'm getting out of here and all these guys are bored as shit and they're all pissed off now that I get to go do something cool and they get to stay here. How long were you going to be gone for? <clears throat> it was supposed to be only, I think, like a week or two. Oh, okay. So it was a short term, mm -hmm. like one time utilization of you in that role. Mm-hmm. And what do they want you to do? What was the role supposed to be? <laughs> this is the best part. I have literally gone and asked everybody I know who are like you. So I've asked Bishop, I've asked Griff, I've asked all these guys, what the fuck was going on in the country in that month? Because I was told nothing. It all depends on uh, uh, the province you were in as well though so, too. And so, but I, I know the province. So I would say, so they said, you're gonna go and you're gonna look after the women and children. Okay. That's all I was told. Follow the bomb doc women and children okay you're your own boss you're doing your own thing we're not going to stop you if you want to say we're searching we're searching if we're stopping we're stopping we are listening to you when it comes to this because we are doing something i was told we're looking for someone and last time they went into the pandora district because that's where i was so we went from kandahar to pandora like overnight landed mm -hmm. in a hot lz and all of that they told me once you get there you're you know you're your own person just stick with a certain you know unit and we're going to move you around okay so I was like, okay, I can do that. That's no problem. So we did that. And so I got there. I met the Brits that I was going to be with, which was the third Scott Battalion from Scotland and the Black Watch. And they're like, you're going to go with them. This is you. They go, they, I'm not even going to try to do the accent because I cannot understand those guys. They're like, this is your female. They did they drop me. Off. This is your woman. You just, that's yours. And I was like, thanks. I'm no one's, but okay. Yeah. So nice to meet you also. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I did I immediately established dominance. And one of the guys said something to me and I just fucking ripped him in half verbally. Cause I was like, you're not going to talk to me that way. And this is just how this is going to go. And so they just were like, Oh, okay. Okay. And so they kind of like, there was a, an air of respect that I got immediately that I had never experienced in the military before. So I was like, okay, I can do this. This is going to be fine. So we go, we go do our thing. Um, and it just was, it was, the fucking shit show from the minute we landed walk me through it what happened when you guys landed uh we were taking rounds uh immediately and uh that was the first time i had landed outside the wire mm -hmm. in one o'clock in the morning pitch black and tracer rounds are going off and so did you have night vision at this point <laughs> i had i had just a the monocle single, yeah i had the yeah. monocle which you know makes shit a little wonky at first if you're not used to it gives me a horrendous headache actually yeah. i can't wear them yeah because it it doesn't make sense to your brain it's trying right. to read it and it's trying to do this and so but the way they had me sitting in the chinook was i was on the floor mm -hmm. and then had guys on top of me i mean there's better ways to arrange that we were packed we were packed, right? There's still better ways to For sure. That. So, but when they, we went to get off, I stood up and my legs buckled and I lost all feeling from my waist down. Because <laughs> the circulation had been yeah. cut off. <laughs> that and adrenaline just kicked in so hard because we were just, you're like, ding, 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 ding. And I was like, they're like, we got to go quick. And I'm like, this is perfect. So I like fucking face down. Yep. And then I felt a big like redhead grabbed me and kicked me in the ass and just like, I right, let's go. And I was like, okay, <laughs> just yep. fucking took off. And so it kind of died down for a little bit. And we sat there. We waited for morning prayer. We went, we kicked the door in and they're like, we're, they straight up told me, we're not going to use you. There's never women and kids here. When we go in to do something, we kick the doors. There's never women and kids right now because we've had so much fighting in the country. After yeah, this they point, leave. they just leave. I was like, fantastic. Then I'm just going to get to 
vacation outside of here and not have to worry about being on a gun. And that was so far from the truth. They used me every fucking compound, every fucking unit, at every time they kicked in a fucking door. So what did they want you to do with the women and kids? Just Search. corral them? No. Oh, Search. Okay. Search. Yeah, it's good that you were there for that. Uh, it doesn't go well when there's no females there to search the Fun females. Fun fact, the first time we did that, the gentleman that owned the place thought I was a man. So when I went in and I grabbed his wife by the arm and I started dragging her to a room, yep. he grabbed the back of my fucking helmet because my hair was blonde and in a braid and tucked in. Gotcha. Because they're like, try not to look like a woman. Can you just try not to look weak for us? And I was like, sure. You can look like a woman and not look weak. Whoever said that is a bitch. Well... You're on the same page as me, my friend. Yeah. So anyway, I did my best to just kind of blend. And uh, yeah, he grabbed me from the back and fucking t tugged on me. And I swung around and I just started going ham and losing my shit. And the interpreter would like split us up, took my helmet off. And I looked at him and was like, fuck you, like one of these moments. And so I just put my helmet back on and I went in and I slammed the metal door thingy or whatever the fuck they want to call it. And there was 12, I had 12 women and kids in there by myself. Jesus. So it was like that at every house. There was an average of five to 12 by myself. And they thought that was a smart decision. Did you ever find anything on the women? All the time. What kind of things? Money they shouldn't have. Yep. Stuff they shouldn't be carrying. Yep. My favorite, have you ever, I don't know if you guys did, if you had any of your females find any, but like they, they, they put things a lot of places. I think I know what you're talking about. That's one place. Yeah. Another one is um, they'll lift up their boob and they'll put stuff under it. Yep. Um, another one is they'll braid it into their hair. Never experienced either of those. Yep. Interesting. So the thing was to do for me, I'd put them in the duck position up against the wall, right? And do the whole thing. But the kicker was I had all these other people behind me and mothers that are losing their fucking mind and doing, yep. you know, so they're grabbing at me and they're grabbing at everything. And, they're... and they didn't have a security person in the room with you? No, 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 no. No, because there was no other female. Holy shit. No, so I had no one. And so my, my deal was to bang on the door when I needed someone. What if you couldn't reach the door? Well, good luck. Wow. I handled it fine. Like yeah. I only had a couple times where I situations went down and I dealt with it in the least lethal manner I could. Yeah. I made the right choice. Proportional escalation. The buttstock of a rifle is a beautiful thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sadder around your face, so you choose. There are other options between those two if we're actually talking about proportional escalation. Well, when they're chasing you with scissors that are about this long coming at your face and they're high as shit and you've got them all over your legs. And yeah, the you don't use a buttstock for that. That's around your face. Yeah, see, I see, but I didn't do that. I didn't shoot her in the face because I, I was genuinely at that point in that deployment. I was incredibly empathetic still. Yeah. So like I just- Don't get me wrong. I am incredibly empathetic as a human being, but if you come at me with a pair of scissors, I'm gonna shoot you right in the fucking face hole. You're, you're right. And I should have for sure, a hundred percent. But this was my first experience with that. And yeah, I was like, fair. I didn't want to cause a kerfuffle. So I was like, I'm just gonna hit her as hard as I can. And it was enough to take her down. And I took them and I just, at that point, I just started grabbing things and throwing it, like everything I had, everything from fucking, the grandma had a Quran, I fucking just started. I lost yeah. patience really quickly. So yeah, that was, I did that for a few days. Uh, by a few days, I mean an extended period of time. Did you have any training in searching people? No, I got training. Um, the, the training was uh, when I landed at Kandahar for that uh, eight hours before I went to the British, I went over to the RCMP cool and they gave me some gloves and they said um here's your zip ties and here's your gloves okay sweet that was so it. you were fully prepared i felt super on top of everything <laughs> Fuck. no questions i mean you basically just had it dialed it was i was as slick and ready to go as any other navy seal would have been right before they go that's fair right that's fair right yeah yeah so <laughs> i went with them and um we had a lot of casualties we had it was a very fucked up operation. Yeah. What were the uh, most casualties coming from? British. No, I mean, we're talking gunfire, IED, oh, combination um, of both. Combination. Okay. Uh, IED was the first, my very first uh, death outside the wire was an IED. And it's I, pretty gnarly, isn't it? It was directly in front of my fucking face. Uh, probably stepped on something, I'm going to guess. Uh, it was, we were going through the Pandora district. We were clearing an area. Um, I was sitting on a wall on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we had uh, uh, the rest of the guys. We had two snipers on the roof, and it was a wide-open clearing. i um, trying to describe here. Right-hand side, wide-open clearing, tree, trees lining both sides. And if you would have went maybe like 200 meters ahead, there was a gray putt. And on the left side of the road, it was not cleared. 
and it was just a bunch of brush, like pretty tall cannabis looking type trees. Mm-hmm. And um, so we sent two people up. We sent uh, McLaren um, and we sent Mark and McLaren, the British use those uh, metal detectors. Yep. And so he went up and we got the comms that they were going inside the grape hut. And those grape huts are like, um, uh, like mud walls with like rectangular holes out of them and they dry grapes on top. And so they kind of act like as a human cheese grater when you blow up inside of them. And so he walked along and we're all, it was all, it was like eerily quiet. And then we started hearing the ICOM radio fucking clear, like, which is the Terp had the radio on. And for people yeah. who don't know, it's like, if it's a walkie talkie. Yeah. If they're close, it's clear. If they're far, it's staticky. That's all I knew. Yeah. And it was like, they're right there. And so we were kind of just all sitting and waiting. And then uh, I turned and I was looking and I was watching and boom, it, he he touched it with a metal detector. The a ID sticks, was in the grape hut. It was in the grape hut at the very back of the grape hut. And it was covered in branches. That is a weird place to put one of those. And it was dug out too. So they like had dug it out enough where, cause it was a big fucking IED. And then they put it in, covered it up a little bit and then just put branches on top of it. Hmm. And he hit just a branch, just the funny way, just as he swiped by. And so, but Mark was down on his hands and knees with his machine gun and he was pointing towards the opening and it went off and McLaren kind of went through and then torso up and out. And then Mark fucking you saw it, you saw the blast just go, just fucking take him off his feet. And you saw his helmet go, his fucking kick go, his rifle go, and he was lying there, and then that's when shit just popped off. Like pop mortars are coming down, we're getting rounds coming from literally everywhere, the snipers are just starting to fire. I don't even know if they know what they're fucking firing at, we're just doing cover fire at this point. And so I hear the radios, the Scots are just going ham, and I'm not saying a word, and then, as soon as that started happening, I just kind of got this like thing in my mind where I was like, I know these aren't, this isn't my country, but I'm going, I'm moving, I'm moving now, moving, moving. Like just started yelling, moving. And then three guys followed with me. And then we jumped into that ditch and they're like screaming. They're like, the road's not clear. Don't fucking go on the road. And so we start running and um, the medic Craig uh, comes with me um, and he goes, we got to get Mark. We have to get Mark. We got to get him off that road now. So him and I jump up onto the road and we start running towards Mark. And Mark is like bleeding from fucking every which side on the left hand side. And it looks like his femur's broken. Like it's he's all kinds of jacked up. And so we run to him and he's his eyes are like you can imagine. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've seen. And um, so we he goes, I need you to hold him down. And so I get like on him and I'm pushing him down. I'm like, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. And this is my first experience and rounds are just. And so, yep. And so mortars are coming and now they're like, okay, we need to move quickly because we need to go. And so we've got uh, a Blackhawk and a angel flight coming for Mark for McLaren and we need to collect him. So then I hold him down. Mark um, is all he kept saying was, where's McLaren? Where's McLaren? Is he good? Is he good? Is he good? And we're like, yeah, yeah, he's fine. He's fine. He's fine. He's fine. He's fine. That's so he the best go- answer in that situation. Well, you don't want him to go into shock. He was already in shock. He didn't want it to go much further because yeah. he was really starting to lose consciousness in and out. And we're like, just, you're fine. He's good. It's great. Ha ha ha. And so he shoots him with some morphine and he stands him up and we wrap his arm and we wrap his leg. And then another guy comes up and takes him with uh, Craig and he goes. And then I jump back down into the ditch and I start running. And it felt like the slow motion tunnel vision and I couldn't get there fast enough to save my life I felt like I was running like with bricks on my feet and so we finally get to the edge of the road and they just go okay we're gonna go on three one two three and we all just started running and then three of us go inside the grape hut and that was my first experience with like seeing what an IED will do to a human being and then we just started collecting without even thinking I just take my helmet off and I just start putting pieces into bags and I don't have gloves on, so that's a big thing for me now. Like skin on food, I don't do anymore. Yeah. And so, w- my buddy's climbing up like the footholds to reach up and grab pieces out of this like cheese grater. And I just remember saying, "I saw his torso fly. It's not in here. He's not all in here." And then my brain switches. I, l- I can remember the fucking moment my light switch went off. I call it my light switch. My humanity, my patience, my empathy, my kindness was gone and I felt it and I know the exact moment it happened and I remember where I was I know exactly how it was and 
the sergeant, Bucky, grabbed me on the back of the shoulder and he goes, Oi, Burns, you all right? And I was like, great. And I reached down into the hole and I pull out his boot with his legs still hanging out of it. And I was like, here's a dark joke. The boot's good. It's still laced up. We can totally reuse it. And he turns and looks at me and goes, okay, she's fine. <laughs> she's going to be great. <laughs> this is going to be all okay. <laughs> and so I start putting in there and then they're like, hey, we have to, we have to move. It's getting, we're getting overrun here. We yeah. got to go. So we put it all on stretchers. We didn't have enough bags, so I just start shoving pieces in pockets. And they're like, okay, who's carrying kit? And so we got two guys, one in the front with a stretcher, another guy in the, with a stretcher, one guy up front sh actually actively shooting, and then um, me behind him, and I've got Mark's helmet, I've got McLaren's helmet, I've got their rifle on me, I've got my kit, and we're just running. And then we drop the fucking stretcher, fucking pick it all back up and get there again. And then we run into it, Blackhawks come, Mark gets on, takes McLaren with him. They put McLaren right beside, like what was left of him right beside him, just tarped it and yeah. was like, he's fine, he's fine. Because they needed to go and start and start firing because we were taking, it was too close. We were getting way, way, we could see them now. This is a problem. So we take that, they just come around and the whole fucking thing and the next thing you know, it just gets dead silent. We sit for like 15 minutes and I just rubbed my hands like incessantly. Like I could not get blood off of me. Mm -hmm. I asked for a cigarette. They're like, nope, you're not smoking. You're not starting now. <laughs> like, nope. And then, and then we're like, all right, off we go. And then off we went. And then it just, shit just kept happening the rest of the fucking week. Yeah. So once that light switch went off and she came at me with scissors, I felt nothing. Did that light switch ever come back on? Or did it take you a long time to... Just recently. Yeah, I was going to say, probably tied to... I was going to say if it was tied to your trip in January. Not necessarily fully tied to that. I think it really started to get better when we had our son. Yeah. When we had our son and, like, I felt a human being come out of me. Yeah. It, I, I got... I would have liked to have thought I would be more emotional when he came out and they put him on top of me, but I was more like... The switch was there and it was teetering and I... I knew I cared and I loved him, but I wasn't fully my it, I hadn't fully switched on yet. Yeah. 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 That took a long time, like a long time. Uh, this trip that you were on for that week, mm -hmm. is this the same one where you were injured? Yeah. So how did that happen? So they counted as um, well, they counted as like, number one, I had blast just like too much blast mm -hmm. blast um, exposure. Yeah. Um, artillery is great. Beautiful thing for that anyway, because you're constantly right beside it. So you get the concussion blast. Um, <clears throat> And then they counted me as injured when, when was that? Gotta think back here, because there, there was a fuck ton of shit. Well, they basically said at the end of that op, based on everything that went down and how I, how it was handled and how close it was for me, like I stepped on an IED, didn't go off. I had a round miss my hip by two inches because it ran into my buddy's buttstock because he just decided he was gonna jump down off the roof for that second. And instead of taking out my, my left hip, I actually have it, I have it tattooed on me because he won't give me the round. Um, it, it just like, so they're like, when I got back, I literally like, I, I looked like I, I had just been outside the wire for like years. And how, what was the total time that you were? Outside the wire with them? Yeah. I think it was like a week and a half. Okay. And it f fucking just turned me off. Like, and I mean, switch off. Like there was no sleeping anymore. There and like none. I would go like four or five days and I would just pace, like just pace. You could not come near me. I wouldn't talk. As soon as they knew I wasn't talking, they're like, oh, we have problems. We have mm -hmm. big, big problems with her. And then as soon as they brought, the, the doctor saw me for like a whopping 30 minutes, like she's done. She's got severe PTSD. Check, done. And then they're like, oh, we'll send her back out to the artillery though. With a laundry list of drugs she's on with a machine gun in her hand. Let's see how that works out. That's insane. It's a good time. Where did they do that diagnosis? Uh, in CAF. Okay, so they flew you down to CAF. For... Yeah, so I went back to CAF with the Brits. Yeah. They, and because we had so many deaths, I had to go sit with their MPs and do the write-ups yeah. of like everything that went on. And so I spent like four days just reciting bullshit that I saw. And then <clears throat> then we did the ramp ceremonies and um, nobody from my unit would stand with me. Why? So, because uh, we had lost a Canadian at the time too. And so we went over, so we were over there doing the Canadian side of it. And then after that, the British were doing their ramp ceremony. And so I asked, can I go, can I go stand over there with them? And they're like, you can go. I went to every ramp ceremony that I could. <clears throat> I, I've only ever been to one because I wasn't, um, because we're in the FOB. 
Yeah. Oh, and for people listening who don't know what we're talking about, it's where you place the caskets on the airplane to fly them home. It's mm-hmm. their final departure from the country. That's right. Yeah. So I stood by myself behind the British um, in formation because those are all the guys that I just went through hell with. And so I wanted to honor that. And I, I was so just uh, bad. I don't even know how, to, I don't even know what other word to use besides bad because like I, I when I, I was not there anymore. And so I, I was so damaged and I was struggling so hard with that ramp ceremony. I had two two like civilians that worked at the Canex on the ba- in calf yep. came and actually physically held me up because I couldn't I couldn't even stand. I was an, I was I was a nightmare. I was then they put me on this laundry list of drugs that could that take they you. gave you all there in Canada. <clears throat> yeah, and they would take you down. They would take you down. I don't feel like it's a good idea to get people on those in a war zone. Well, yeah, and then they put me back out to the fall, but right after. That's just idiotic. It sure is. Yeah. Did you finish the rotation there at the FOB? So, no. So what happened was um, we I got out there and we were firing for, I think we were doing like some loom rounds for the guys. And um, it was a night shoot. And so my sergeant said, listen, we're going to do just a couple of us on the guns. Um, I know you're working the OP tower, but do you mind coming down back and forth? And Because we always have two on the tower. And so did you mind just coming down? And I was like, yeah, no problem. I, I got no issue with that. I came back. I told him. I said, he goes, like, I walked up to him and he looked at me and he goes, you good? And I just looked him straight in the face and I didn't say fucking word and I walked away. And and for if you knew me before, I mean, I'm loud and mouthy now because I'm more like myself now. But before, like, I was like next level. Like, I was so fucking annoying. I was 19 and fucking annoying. And so when I said nothing for a whole week and I didn't mouth back, I didn't. I would do whatever they said. I would work on the gun, but you could see I was out of it. I was fucking out of it. And you were on meds at this point. Oh yeah, these are the meds. I was I was fucking out of it. Like even more so just from like not just the trauma, but just from the meds. I was completely like gone. And so I just sat there and I would just I would just run the gun. And I would just like do 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 like that's how what was going on in my brain. My brain wasn't on. And then um we I had a situation on the tower. There was a compound not far outside of it. And there was always this little girl that used to walk her cow regularly. And during my shift, I would see her every morning. And she would wave, just do her thing, whatever. And there had been a few situations inside that fob where I had intervened and saw somebody used me as the soft target and tried to get information from me when they got in the fob when they shouldn't have been inside the fob. Hmm. But I spoke English, so they came up to me. And then I got to hang out with people like you when they came over and said, you're going to put a round in your rifle right now and you're going to stand there, okay? And we'll be right back. And so there was some shit that I had just happened to be involved in a lot of shit. Um, And so the day I saw her walking, um, when I thought she was waving, well, she was waving. What I thought she was doing was pointing a gun at me. And so I fully racked that fucking thing. And I sat there and the guy beside me, his eyes like out of his head, he goes, what the fuck are you doing? So did you not just see the gun in your hand? Are you fucking kidding me? How are you not seeing that? And he's like, you need to go to the fucking tower, right? Like go down to the radio tent right now and just tell them what just happened. And I was like, this is what I saw. And they're like, okay. Mm, yeah, this isn't good anymore. She, This isn't safe anymore for her. Mm-hmm. And so they took me down and they said, you're going to stay here until we can get you back to Kandahar. And then eventually they got me back to Kandahar. But before that, right before they sent me back out to the FOB, they sent me on my HLTA. I don't know what that is. Holiday break. Okay. Mm-hmm. So right after that op, like right after that fucking op with all those drugs, they said, you can go get on a plane to Dubai, to Heathrow, to Toronto, and meet your mom in Dominican Republic for three weeks. Drink your face off, do whatever the fuck you want. Hopefully nothing bad happens to you. And while you're out of country, you had a bunch of your friends die. So that's going to be totally fine and normal and nothing weird happened there. And when you come back to country, we're going to send you back to the FOB. So that's kind of how that went. They, they left me too long. They and then when they took me back to Kandahar, they're like, "Don't worry about all your stuff. We'll send it to you. Like you're coming back. Don't worry about it." I never got to go back. Yeah. So I, they ripped me away from my unit, and then they put me in a QM counting pens. QM to stand for quartermaster. Yep, uh, counting pens in country to keep me busy. And then how did they get you back to the states? Oh no, they just sent me back by myself. Okay. With a bayonet in my fucking carry-on that I got through somehow 
to Dubai, through Heathrow, through London, to Toronto, and then landed in Quebec at 2 a.m. to an empty airport and was told to just figure the fuck out. And that's where they put you into the QM, the quartermaster. No, in in country, like before they sent me home. Like, so while they were waiting for my flight, yeah. they're like, we're not going to send her the guns. We're not going to let her just do what she needs to do. We're not going to let send her to the doctor very much. We're just going to put her in the QM. She's going to count fucking pens. What did they expect you to do, uh, not at the actual airport itself, but when you got back to Quebec, what were you supposed to do? Didn't care. They said report to the RSM when you get there. Okay, so back to your command. My command. Yeah, yep. and what did the command want you to do? He slapped me with a piece of paper and said, you're posted at Ottawa Hospital. Bye. Okay. So then I got sent to the hospital. How was that? I was there for a little bit. I mean, I did in and out. They let me do outpatient because I was I got an apartment really close. Yeah. Um. So was this for counseling or, you know, what were they trying to do for you at the hospital? Uh, all different types of assessments at that point to see the severity of what they were dealing with. Yeah. And so they end up... Uh, Diagnosed me with severe post-traumatic stress disorder, um, major depressive disorder, and I think I think that was it at the time. And then so they just gave me this list of drugs and they said you need to take this. And then you come back. I would come back like three, four times a week and talk with the doctor. And they would reassess. And then they're like, okay, let's try EMDR and let's try this and we're gonna try that. And then that only happened though for like the first month or two. And then no one contacted me again for six months. What were you doing with your time during that six months? I don't know. Yes, you do. All right, we'll talk about it offline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't need it on record that I was doing things I probably shouldn't have been doing in Fair. places I probably shouldn't have been going. Fair. Right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were basically left to figure it out yeah. for your own. 100%. 150%. When did the military decide that they were going to outprocess you? They didn't. They called me and said, we're going to try to retrain you first. Okay. So you're going to reorg you. So we, we can do one of two things. You can remuster to something, which we we're not advising right now, or we can try to retrain you and get you back on the guns. And so I said, let's try to retrain me and get me back on the guns. And by retrain, they mean just go back through the same pipeline you've already been through? Nope. They wanted to expose me slowly to gunfire, that kind of stuff, just slowly though. So they said, we're gonna send you to a range. You're gonna work at Connaught Range in Ottawa on the hill where the guys are. Mm -hmm. um, it's the largest, com one of the largest Commonwealth ranges in North America. And um, it's a fantastic range and it's got uh, NRA people, civilian people, RCMP, special ops guys. So there's helicopters coming in and out. Lots of stuff is going on. Mm -hmm. Stuff I really shouldn't need to be around at the time. And they're like, you're gonna do two half days a week. You're gonna do Tuesday mornings and you're gonna do Thursday mornings and you're gonna report there. And then you're just gonna do whatever they tell you to do. So I did that for a while. And then we had a protected bird sanctuary there. And so we like would fuck around on like hovercrafts and just nothing too crazy. Um, and then they're eventually like, you know, we think this is going well. And I was like, I'm glad you do. Um, and they're like, you know, we're gonna, uh, you're gonna go clear a grenade range for the first time since you've been back. Just go clear the range. There's just some guys doing some uh, just light training. I was like, okay, it's like whatever, not thinking anything of it. I get out of the truck. I walk towards the sand. My feet touch the sand and I f fucking freeze. And I buckle like, like right to my knees. And the sergeant came around and just fucking picked me up and put me back in the truck. And they're like, she's done. And that was the line. That was yeah. my line. That was my chance and I fucking blew it. I don't think you blew it. I think you weren't ready to be back in that environment. I know I wasn't ready to be back in that environment. I blew it in the sense that that was my opportunity to stay in the military and I couldn't get it together enough to do that. I don't think <laughs> the continued military service was the thing for you at that point. At that point, no. At that point, no, for sure. Yeah, it, would, it wasn't the right thing for you. No, I, I And would, it wasn't the right thing for the military either, to be honest. No, I, listen, I... The one thing I can say about the service and the deployment that I did is I've now, while I was writing that book, I got the chance to go back and talk to, um, I'm very close with like the family members of those people that were lost. Mm -hmm. I still talk to the wives or the widows and the daughters and all of that. I'm still very involved in that community. I'm not involved at all with the Canadians. Those guys never spoke to me after. Nobody found out where I was. I just found out two months ago, my Sergeant LeBlanc, I said, I, cause I wanted to kind of talk to him. I, I wanted to let him know I had some things in the works. There was going to be some actors. I need to talk to you. This is what's happening. 
And he's like, I got on the phone with him for the first time in 10 years. And he goes, holy fuck, Burns. They didn't tell me where you went. They wouldn't tell me where you went. They wouldn't tell me where you were going. They wouldn't tell us what happened to you. All we knew is something happened, but the guys had no fucking clue. Wow. So they're like, I'm like, so that's why nobody reached out to me. So my whole time I'm thinking like, these people hate me, da, 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 da. And this is part going through all my head for the past 10 years. And he's like, nobody hated you. We just didn't know what happened to you. Yeah. And so the few people I did tell, like very quick things about, they laughed in my face that there's no way that you did any of that. And then recently this year, I spoke with some of the Brits I served with. And it was one of the best moments of my life was when I had a sergeant say to me, you were a fucking legend on that operation. To just get that and hear that and know that I did what I thought I did, but to hear it from somebody else on the outside perspective, because I was told, when I got back, uh, when I was still in country, the major I had, I called him Major Dick in my book because I can't say his name because I'm pretty sure he's still in. Is it Richard? I wish it was fucking Richard. <laughs> Fuck, it would be awesome. Because then Major Dick would be appropriate. I think it's just appropriate because his last name starts with a D, so that's right. what he gets. Fair. And he's French, so fuck him. And so he uh, threw papers, my medical papers, and threw it at me and said it would have been easier if you fucking died. So, like, I wasn't super stoked wow. on the Canadians, like, my own unit at the time. They, I was so damaged. I was so dragged out of my mind. I would, like, a captain would say something to me, and I would just tell him to straight fuck off. And so I was getting, like, insubordination written up. Like, and then that's when they got me diagnosed, because they're like, something's going, this is not, she's a shithead, but she's not that far. She knows the line. What day did they actually separate you from the military? Like like uh, like full like out out like you were done yeah. May twenty third two thousand eleven. How'd you get yourself off those meds? Um, so uh, for a long time I didn't. For like the first six years, um, I was on them. the The worst part about those drugs, uh, if they're not if, if they're not the right drugs for you. You have memory loss. You I would wake up like my husband's sitting in here and he knows like I would wake up in the middle of the night and make a whole loaf of bread and eat it like I have no memory like these drugs were just so heavy hitting on my system do you remember what any of them were uh, I know no 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 I can actually find out but I don't I don't was it a combination of uh, psychiatric drugs and also uh, I don't know if you were in any pain but was it a combination of opiates as well too or just straight uh, psychiatric type drugs psychiatric type drugs okay. I wasn't I wasn't in any physical pain I was in a lot of physical pain but I didn't complain about it okay I, I, I'm used to physical pain. I kind of just, they have one, one ear out the other with me with that. And so they, a lot of psychiatric drugs. So I just, like you would take it and then you're supposed to sleep right away, but I couldn't sleep because I was struggling to sleep. And so I'd just be up and I would just run my mouth and talk and talk, 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 talk. and he'd be like, do you remember anything you fucking said to me last night? And I was like, nope, no clue. I would just go off, no clue. Wow. Yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't like super great in, it was about five years ago though that my doctor said, hey, I said, you know, I can't, I want to have a child. I can't be on these drugs to have a child. I want to be able to do these things. And he goes, listen, it's not legal yet, but would you be open to cannabis? And at the time I grew up where it's like, if I was caught smoking cannabis, like I'd be beat with a fucking belt for like a week. Like there's no chance that was in my repertoire. Potentially that's an extreme reaction to being caught smoking a little weed. Yeah, my family. Not, not that I advocate that, but Jesus Christ, again, proportional response. Yeah, well. <laughs> Here we are. Yeah. My dad grew up with 12 brothers and sisters with no running water and a farm. Okay. And he was the baby. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's how I grew up. And so I knew better and I never tried. And I said, you know, I'm not really for that. My, my in-laws, I said, aren't going to jive with that. And I don't know how I feel about doing it. He's like, listen, if you want to have a kid, you can have a child. If you're off of those drugs and you're using this for your symptoms, it's fine. It will be fine. And I was like, okay. So I tried it. And then um, very How'd slowly. they introduce it to you? Mm, uh, he let me go through a friend of mine that was very knowledgeable. He goes, talk to her first. Uh, I mean, did they, were you smoking it? Did they give you edibles? What was the they, delivery? He didn't tell me. He okay. said, you can chew, try. I want you to try a few things. So I tried edibles. I tried edibles. <laughs> um, but I did them wrong. Um, I feel like dosage might have been an issue. It here. wasn't just dosage. <laughs> I just had knee surgery. Yeah. And um, I was on oxycodone at the same time. Oh, fuck. And we just bought our very first townhouse, which was lots of stairs. And my mom came out to visit. And our friend, Uncle Sushi, he made us brownies. 
And so he gave me a piece of brownie and I was like, I feel nothing. This is stupid. Why am I doing this? But maybe I'll have another piece of brownie. But then he was like, don't eat any more. I've had three. I'm 315 pounds. I've had three. So like they're talking and watching a movie fucking around and I'm like, I'm going to fucking have more. Nobody's going to tell me what I can't do. So I go and I cut like six pieces. You're getting onto a ride that you cannot get off of. Oh, I learned that the hard way. <laughs> Here's the best part. They put Avatar on. Uh -huh. I am terrified at the thought of this, actually. Yeah, it got worse. So um, I had all these, and then it hit me, and then yeah. it really hit me. And then I thought I was having a seizure, but apparently I was bone still. But I couldn't, but then my mouth was dry. But my Gatorade was there. But I couldn't get my hand to my mouth. So I just, I, I just did this. Uh, and I couldn't, and they have it on video. And so um, I, n I have never ever had edibles since so i am strictly an oil and a uh, smoke based it's an understandable <laughs> my father oh many years ago made some brownies for a new year's eve party okay and my great uncle who has since passed for whatever reason decided that was the night that was the night and became paralyzed in a chair <laughs> And uh, another person was holding on to the fireplace, like, help me, help me, I can't move. I'm in the military at this time, not even touching this stuff. Well, just yeah, you like, can't. What the fuck is in those things? It's crack. It, yeah, the ride you can't get off of. You can't. They call the next day. I forget who it was that called, but basically said, I felt like I was going driving the Millennium Falcon, home, <laughs> but I was going 35. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels like. You're going so fast, but your brain is... Yeah. I don't blame you. That's that's a rough intro. It was. It was bad. Bad news bears. So yeah. I never did it again. Um, but but then how did the oil and smoke help you? Changed everything. Um, over a gradual period of time of five years, I went from all those pharmaceutical drugs, and I think at the at the height of it, must have been eight and ten drugs. Different ones for different things, yeah. different times. Um, just a cocktail. And... I slowly started integrating it and then we slowly started working it out of the system and then up until uh, December of last year I was only on one pharmaceutical drug for the past three years before that and it was just Zoloft mm -hmm. just so antidepressant because I have major depressive disorder that's what they say I do I don't fucking think I'm that depressed but I obviously get lows so I understand so I didn't fight it, but I was like, I really want to be off of this. Like, I really don't like this. I don't like the dependency. I don't like if I travel, if I run out, I get like violent head rushes, like where I feel like my head is literally like I'm ZZ Top on a fucking concert. If you run out of it. Yes. Really? Oh, violent. I've Have never you? heard of that. No. Never had withdrawals, eh? Uh, I've never really you. been on those type of drugs okay well that's they, they have me on pain meds yes. but pain meds don't work very well on me i have a genetic blood abnormality that just it processes opiates differently oh is that good or a bad thing depends <laughs> okay. on whether or not you get hurt and need pain meds okay <laughs> I, I feel bad for you right now no i mean it's it it is what it is and i think i'm fortunate that that's the case because it didn't give them a chance to really get their hooks into me addiction yeah yeah i mean i, I it was I've heard from people who have said that I took an oxy and like, fuck me. It was the best feeling ever. And I was hooked from that moment. To me, I would just get, they would prescribe to me oxy or give them to me. And I'm like, I don't just, I'll put them in the toilet. Like it did, right. it did nothing for me. Right. So there was not that, there wasn't that hook that could get in. Right. I think, I mean, I could be completely wrong, but I think it played a, uh, a part in that. Well, I'm sure it did. If you think about it and how, and how quick. Uh, and addictive those things can be of course it had for to have some something. people well, yeah not for everybody but but for the people that it does it's quick because it, it's that's such a good i don't yeah. think they feel good they make me feel sick so i didn't like enjoy it yeah so i've never really had that like because i've had lots of surgeries and i've like never stuck with them after ever i run out and i'm like tylenol if i need it yeah or weed now so i got to the point where i was on that and then right before I went to go away to come to the States this January, in order to do ayahuasca safely, you cannot be on a serotonin reuptake drug, which is an SSRI, so an antidepressant. What's the risk there? Uh, serotonin reuptake psychosis. That doesn't sound awesome. No, it's not. It's not something you want to lie about. It'll yeah. fuck your world up. Yeah, but what does that look like, though? Um, it's basically where your serotonin spikes and stays there violently. Yeah, I don't know much about serotonin, but I feel like that's bad. It's it's really really bad. It can it can dip you into a psychosis. 
Okay. So yeah, probably best to be transparent mm-hmm. about where you're at in life on that. Right. And so for the past year though, during COVID, um, in the in January of last year, was it 2020 we went to China? I don't remember if it was, it was the year that COVID, yeah, 2020. So my husband and I went over to China to visit some factories and- um, During the pandemic. It wasn't a pandemic yet. Okay. It was like, I got announced the day we got home. Your timing was fortunate. It's, I have- Huh, I am known for timing, my friend. Okay. Hence this. There you go. All right. So uh, we got home. I got fucking violently sick. Did you guys happen to go to Wuhan? We were around. <laughs> we weren't in Wuhan. We were in Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and buses and trains and planes and yeah. all of the fun bits. So we were around. I got home. They said, you have severe pneumonia. Here's some steroids. Thank God they gave me steroids when they did. Um, and anyway, so for that year... We were all going through what everybody was in business and COVID. It was just wiping. It's a shit show. It was a shit show. So March comes around and they go, we're going to close all your stores. And I go, okay, how do I fix this? So I go, okay, well, I know my factory can make masks. Okay, cool. How do I do this? Okay, so I'm going to get my medical license now. So I I know how to get a medical license for the government. And I start applying and I provided masks for uh, 200,000 masks for hospitals in Ontario. So I did that. And so I, we did that for a little bit. And then I was like, I don't want to deal with this anymore because the paperwork is a nightmare. Absolutely. Nightmare. And then just getting stuff on planes overseas during COVID was yeah. not even doable. So then we went and we just kind of got to the point where business was taking a dip. And it was frustrating because before that we were growing two and a half times. I had donated half a million dollars. My goal was to just do that. My goal was to help in a way I knew I could. And when that's kind of wiped out from underneath you, it felt like the military again. Almost like you lost your sense of purpose again. It's 150% exactly what happened to me. 150%. And so through that, last year, I saw this downtick in my mental health. Like, bad. Yeah. As I think did a lot of people. Exactly. I know a few peripheral people that have died from COVID, Mm -hmm. like a distant relative of somebody that I kind of know. I know quite a few people that have killed themselves. Yeah. Of course, because the epidemic of suicide is up 900% in Canada. And so... That's a fucking crazy statistic. You know what else is really crazy? Our overdose rate is the highest in like almost the entire world right now and nobody fucking cares about it. I was not aware of that. COVID related. Interesting. Yeah. So we we have a homeless population, a epidemic of suicide, and then we also have an opioid overdose epidemic like has never been seen before. Like I've got friends who are firefighters who are getting 14 to 15 calls a day for just overdoses. It's 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 ra- it's, it's it's astronomical. So the thing for me was the thing that made me honestly put me on a level playing field that was like finally the stuff I'd been screaming about veterans about for the past five years because that was my purpose of starting my company brass and unity wasn't started because I wanted to just help myself it was really a, like a means to an end I was tired of getting my friends well calls from my friends parents being like so and so killed himself so and so did this so and so was in the hospital it got to a point where I was getting so angry and felt like I couldn't help in any way shape or form and so I was like if I donate almost everything I make to these organizations that are doing the work on the front lines so like Honor House Children's of Fallen Patriots those types of people okay now I know that I'm doing something right and at least I know it'll pay off for someone even if I don't know them talk to them or touch them it's helping someone and so when that happened and it started ticking down and I was no longer able to donate at the level I was, everything just started to crumble for me. Yeah, cascades. Oh, did as ever. But the rest of the world was finally understanding what I was screaming about. Mental health is a fucking problem and we don't pay attention to it enough. And we don't think it's acceptable to have conversations about. When you Why do you think that is? I think that's one of two things. I think there's a pride in it. People don't want to admit when they're struggling because then, God forbid, somebody thinks something about them. Yeah, but who in their right mind could walk around and play that charade of I my life is perfect, but probably everybody else's is fucked up? I mean, just walking through life for the number of years that I've had, I've watched a number of people go through struggles. It's like we all have our ups and downs and our challenges. Okay, because here's the thing, though. You have to remember you're an individual who has traveled the world. You're an individual who's been around a lot of different people, different cultures, different places, and different times. It's true. Think about the people who haven't. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a fair point. Right? So I try to look at it at that perspective because I've had a unique perspective on the world, just as you have, and so many other people who have been in the military who have traveled and been outside of their small town. I know plenty of people who have never left their town. 
Same. That just crushes my soul. It's a different way to live life. I mean, I yeah. don't ever want to tell people how to live their lives. No. But I will certainly say that, you know, I grew up in Santa Cruz, California, which is a great place to mm -hmm. grow up. The best thing that I did was leave, though. Right. Because it gave me a different view of the world. And right. I have nothing against people who have lived in Santa Cruz their entire life. But when I have conversations with them, their view of the world is definitely from a different angle and lens than mine. And it becomes very difficult to find common ground. Do you find that it's because they're probably mostly getting their information from news sources on the internet rather than getting it from experience? It's just very insulated. Okay. You know, if you see the same nine people yeah, and you're... you hear, you know, it's, it, you know, it's just, yeah. if that's your world, if your world is that really small Bay Area right there where I grew up and you don't travel and see and experience, it can give you a really fucked up perspective on mm -hmm. a lot of flashy terms like oppression or struggle or, you know, fill in the blank. Right. It, 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 it changes the viewpoint. And again, I'm not here to say that the, that's right or wrong. I do think one of the best things I like I'm a full fan of the concept or idea of mandatory service for okay. young men and women. But it doesn't have to be in the military. Like two years? Are you talking? I would say, yeah. But it, again, it doesn't have to be in the military. Okay. Red Cross. Doctors Without Borders, Got it. go serve something greater than yourself and try to do it outside of where you live. I think it would absolutely change people's perspective. I think it would round the uh, corners on a lot of the bullshit that people complain about. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's not not saying what they complain about is bullshit. Depends. It does depend. They would probably choose to not put their flag in the ground on certain issues mm -hmm. that they seem to be willing to fight fight to the death about. I just think it would be better and it would be the combination of serving something greater than yourself mm -hmm. but also seeing something different mm -hmm. than what you're surrounded by all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've most of the trips I've been on, especially in my military career, were not to the five-star locations. You know, no. tri trip advisor was like, "Hey, avoid at all costs." Right? Um, <laughs> but even that, it's wow. I mean, the level of appreciation I have for what we have yeah. is uh, hard to describe. Well, so. no, I, I I can get that and I can respect that. It's like the small town if I stayed in, I know there's plenty of people that still live there. And that's yeah. fine. And if that's how you want to live your life, I applaud It's a different it. world, though. It's a world I can't wrap my brain around. Correct. Because you left it. Yeah. And I don't know that I would want to try to wrap my brain around it either. It breaks me when I think about that. Yeah. At, you know, they may not even realize it, though, because it's not that they're trapped. But if they never left, it's this closed loop. And it, it that's their world. I, I See... I want to disagree on that point only a little bit because I think now with access to social media the way that we yep. have it, I think that that it can't be like that anymore. You have to be able to see. You, you're seeing things. You can't tell me you're not witnessing those things. You're not reading about those seeing things. Seeing and experiencing seeing. are two very different of things. Of course. Yes, you're right on that. So, yeah. And let's be honest. <laughs> Most people on social media suck. They're not there to experience anything. No. All right. <laughs> They'll be like, look at how pretty I am. <laughs> yeah. Look at how pretty I am. There's some of that. There's a lot of that. There is some of that. Yeah, it's uh, in my industry. There's all of that. In fashion. In fashion. I believe the recipe is show portions of your ass, but from different angles, and your following goes through the roof. Listen, I would like to try that. I, that maybe that's what I'm doing wrong. That's what I'm doing wrong. I'm not showing enough ass. I don't know. And apparently, it's I think yoga pants and different angles is supposed to, like that's how you do it. But you got to be like a CrossFit person too, because you got to do the stance. You know, you do the stance where your ass cheek looks really big on the one side with the yoga pants. I'm not sure that's CrossFit related. That it stance, is CrossFit. No. I think that's just a stance. <laughs> that is totally CrossFit related, at least with the people I follow. One foot up. Yeah. Heel slightly elevated. Well, no, that's like combat Barbie shit. Like, combat Barbie stuff. Yeah, that's like stuff. Tell she me does. more. Do you know who Combat Barbie is? No. How the fuck would I know who Combat Barbie is? She's got like a million and some odd followers. And she, Let I me guess tell she... you who's not one of them. Okay, never mind. So. Okay, well, <laughs> you, you, you might be after you see her ass on this. I'm going to take a hard pass. It, okay, good that for you. That is to me good for you. the single biggest fucking waste of time. Oh. I will unfollow people who do that shit. I appreciate this perspective quite a bit right now. I'm not going to lie to you. That made me a lot happier. You know what? You're a little less TBD right now. You're a little more in the trust TBD? tree. TBD yeah. to be determined. Yeah, you're not so. You're, you're you're slowly in the nest, the trust tree in the nest. You're getting there. Okay. I'm liking the perspectives I'm hearing. Yeah, I'm just. I mean, I'm at a point in my life where that shit. It's just like I can see the transparency. Yes. Yes. I've been around enough people who promote this. My life is perfect bullshit on social media, and I watch them fucking falling apart. Yeah. And they only want to put up good. They don't want to talk about the real things that every fucking one of us struggle with. They'd rather try to like. Yeah. You know 
buff that out and it's it's i just i'm like okay i see what you're doing and honestly i don't have fucking time for it well that, that's what it is it's a time thing too it's like i also don't want to put that in my brain because i've literally got 962 things to do and the last thing i need to do is sit there and stare at you if i want to talk to you i'll talk to you if i don't want to talk to you you're not in my fucking if you don't have my number then then don't complain to me yeah. you're not worth my time that's a harsh that's harsh but i've had to start doing that if you don't have my direct phone number your complaints do not matter to me. I was thinking about this not too long ago. I was having a conversation with somebody, and we were talking about essentially things. Okay. And it was the- Like stuff or like things? Like stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah. Objects. Right. Um, and I get it. People like certain things. I enjoy certain things way more than others, but I realized I'm at a place in my life where subtraction is a lot more important than addition. Isn't it a beautiful thing when you just purge stuff? Purge stuff? And sometimes stuff needs to include people. Oh, I purge people. Ta talking about what you, people who don't have your direct phone number. Yeah. It has been, subtraction to me has been one of the healthiest things that I've ever done. But mm -hmm. earlier in my life, I thought it was all about addition. Yes. And I think a lot of people, maybe most, maybe all, go through that phase. It was, it was kind of life changing. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know what? No, no, we're gonna go the other way. When did you start doing this? I'd say about two and a half years ago. Okay. I started realizing, um, well, thoughts, you know, I changed my mind about money, which is a huge topic where people, it's all about addition, right? You got to have more money. money when money, I was money. actually working for CrossFit, because I actually worked directly for CrossFit for like eight years. So what you're saying is you worked for CrossFit and also sweaty dudes. So sweaty dudes have been in your repertoire for a long time. Approximately, yes, and peripherally. Mm, it's just okay. part of who I am at okay. a, a genetic level. Let's not forget the shorts we wore in SEAL training. No comment. Yeah, there should be no comment on those. They should be in the <laughs> fucking garbage on fire. But I stayed in the job longer than I should have, and it was based off of my tricking myself in saying I'm making X amount of money, which in hindsight was not an incredible amount of money. Right. But I stayed because I didn't think I'd be able to replace it, and I was so unhappy with the job. And I finally got to a point where I just quit and didn't have another job. And But it changed my perspective on money. And money to me is not the most valuable thing. For me, the most valuable thing is time. Right. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate money, but money is a vehicle to either subtract or add time. Correct. Not things. And so I started, I mean, I, I had that shift in my philosophy. That would be back in like 2014, 2015. The subtraction when it comes to things, yeah, it was about two, two and a half years ago you're just standing there, you know, stand at your house and just take it in. Mm -hmm. The shit you have, like, and now I have a hard policy and it starts with even like clothing. Okay. We have seasonal stuff here, obviously, so I'm not going to like throw out a jacket that I like because I haven't worn it in six months. Because you get winter? Yeah, we get winter. But, yeah. you know, t shirts, I haven't worn that in six months. I'm donating you. Like, right. subtraction. Instead yeah. of having the full drawers, I'd rather have open space in the drawers. And it's right. been, it takes up less of your time. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel like my life is more in order, which helps my brain feel better. It, yeah. It's it. There's power in that. No, there is a hundred percent. Yeah. And I didn't click over to that until I was in my forties. From that subtraction aspect and the the physical things in my life. The wow. like I said, the money thing was a little bit like late thirties, but really, it, it's powerful. Yeah. And so, have you found that you're just are you downsizing in general? Everything from social circle to people that I will. I think I have like close friends that I maintain what I would consider to be good contact with, like five or less. Okay, yeah, and then, you sound like me. <clears throat> but uh, for, I have social circles that I enjoy being a part of, but like truly yes. uh, people that I would consider to be in my inner circle, probably like, yeah, like five or maybe 10 at maximum. And I don't want any more than that. Because I used to have the thought of, well, I need to add more people to that because that's what I need. And I realized that for me, that's not necessarily healthy. It was healthier for me to have less. Um, yeah, it's in, in all things. Do you find that you maintain those relationships better now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes a big difference on how that is within those people, doesn't it? Yeah. Just how they, how they react to you, how they think about you, the type of person you are. It's a higher quality relationship. Right. Yeah. Yes. Quality over quantity. Yeah. And I've adopted the principle that I've heard with uh, people when it comes to hiring new employees. You hire slowly, but you fire fast. Yeah. Yeah. Take your time. Don't, it's not just sit down and do like, hey, so uh, what's your favorite color? Oh, you're fucking hired. Like, <laughs> no, it's multiple interviews, you know, yes. taking your time. And then when things go wrong, like, hey, you're fired. We're going to we're not going to allocate or devote 
yeah. more additional time to that. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that with relationships either. I think, speaking anecdotally for me, it's made my life better. Yeah, I'd have to agree. I've I've gone through that stage over the past year. I think COVID really just opened a lot of eyes for a lot of people. Yeah. And for me, it COVID tested people. Yeah. Where the way society has never been tested before. And it showed me who I really want to associate and who I don't. Yeah, the curtain came back quite a bit. Oh, yeah. Well, it surprised me because I didn't realize how much people don't get pressed in their in their day to day. Right? Especially in a first world country. I mean, let's be honest. You've mm -hmm. been over to Afghanistan. I mean, I've been in places there where, I mean, people will never go farther than they can walk in their entire life. That's right. They might have a, a battery of some kind in a single light bulb for a village, and they're drinking out of the same stream that they shit in. So, yep. and not always upstream from where they. Should. No, it's shit. always it's almost always downstream, and it and there's no no rhyme or reason why because you can see the flow of the water, you can see the people, yeah. and they can see it, and they just keep doing it. Yeah. Those people are pressed on, yeah. on a day-to-day -day level in, in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying there's not challenges in the first world, but the challenges are certainly different. And I think a lot of those people in uh, places like that in Afghanistan would probably trade just about everything that they have mm -hmm. to inherit the situations in the United States that people on the daily complain about. Oh, that absolutely. That would be a rapid escalation of their quality of life. But people got pressed for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, they got really pushed into a corner – and I was surprised by how quickly the masks cracked. Oh, and they cracked so fast yeah. in my instance for a lot of people. And I saw it and it was one of those moments where I, for a minute there, because I'm getting, I don't say I'm getting, I'm getting softer in like a mental capacity. I'm getting kinder again. So like I've softened up a little bit in the way that I deal with people in situations. I don't just write you off and say, go fuck yourself like I used to. Mm. I still do that, but I've- There's a time and place for there's this There's a time too. and place, but before it was like, that was all the place and all yeah. of the time. It's not, it shouldn't be your only tool. Well, it definitely was for a while. So it was a struggle. Yeah. So, so then I got to the point where it wasn't. And now when this started happening, I was talking to people and I remember talking to my husband about it being like, you know, I can't, I can't take this fucking text messages anymore. I, I, I have no response. I've done my best. I can do what I can do. Yeah. I've responded the way I thought was appropriate. I've been kind, kinder than I normally am. And I'm still getting shit for it. No, I can't do it anymore. And I just, I started cutting people out. And it was a harder thing to do than I expected it to be. But I knew as soon as Only that happened. Only when you start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once you start, that shit feels good. And I hate saying it because that's, you know, there's people that have been in your life for extended periods of time, but when you see the way they react, how they react and how they are to you and the rest of the world at that point, once they're tested by something where you just know they've been tested before. So like, what, what the, what is this? And now they're acting like, mm -mm, I couldn't do it anymore. I just had to start. And then I started to enjoy it. Like a lot. And then I was and like. And it can be taken too far as well because you could end up a fucking hermit on a desert island by yourself. Like that would be too far. Well, that's too far. But we didn't go that far. We, yeah. we kind of backed it off. We backed it off to be like four or five people where I'm like, you, I'm good with you. You're good with me. And, and I'll be here for you for everything. And I'll call you and I, you've got my number and I'll answer. If I don't answer, I'll call you back. I've got systems with friends where if they're, because one of them lives back east actually in Ontario where it's been locked down and she is been locked in with two kids and school's been closed for she is literally losing her mind and she is struggling like mentally and it breaks my heart because i've known her since we've been like, seven years old yeah. and we have a system where it's like call me three times in a row because then i know this is like i have to whatever i'm yep. doing needs to stop but i have a system with certain people and those certain people know the process and if you're not one of those people then don't bother because I, I don't have the capacity, I don't have the bandwidth in my own brain anymore to deal with it. But I've had to learn how to put those boundaries in like recently, about a year, about a year now. I've really, really, you know, concrete. Those are the boundaries. I'm sorry if you don't like them. I don't mean to be a C word because I'm trying not to say that word on your podcast, even though I say it on mine on a continuous basis. Yeah. I try to be a good person. But if I'm not still good enough, even though I'm trying my best for you, then you're not supposed to be in my life. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's well just, said. it's that simple. And so that's a struggle for individuals, though. I don't know if you've noticed that, but that is a struggle for people. Very much so. Yeah. Well, I think we're taught at a very early age that the primary con concern in all things should be addition. Correct. 
add, 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 have more, have and more, everything. have more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People, places, things. Actually, I don't know how you add places, but you know. You can add places by adding homes and places. There you go. There are your places. So you figure it out. I knew there was some way to you know tie that all together, put a little bow on it, if you will. See, aren't you glad you brought me on now? I am actually. It a only... fascinating human being. So you didn't, you didn't expect any of this, did you? I don't actually have any. I try to just go into every single time I sit down with somebody with no expectations. I do the same. Yeah. I find it's a struggle. I find I have a harder time having a conversation with someone when I go in with an expectation. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, because they may not realize the expectation and right. they might be letting you down of some preconceived notion that they have no idea about. Yeah, I think you right. can really taint a conversation by going in with an idea of how it may go. Well, so I had a conversation on my show um, with... Brass and Unity. Yeah, the Brass Let's and talk about it so maybe people could find it. Uh, sorry. Obviously, you're, I'm really bad at that. Obviously, I, you're not an expert in marketing. I'm not. It's obvious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better at it. But it's because I try not to. I'm proud of it. Yeah. And I think it's fucking fantastic. And I think the people who know about it think it's fucking fantastic. And I know it can be even bigger and that much more helpful for people. But Well, why'd you start it? The podcast? Yes. Truthfully? Yes. My manager. We had talked about doing a podcast for about a year before this. Okay. And I... I love talking to people, like genuine conversation though, not like, hey, this yeah. is who I am, two minutes on the news and bye. Like, That's I don't... Just, those are pleasantries. Yeah, those are whatever. So I like to genuinely have deep conversation with people because I think there's a lot to be said for different perspectives and we don't have enough of that in our world right now. There's a bajillion podcasts, but if you look at the actual stats of how many people actually listen to mm -hmm. podcasts, most people quit after seven episodes. So I wanted to make sure if we were gonna do this, we we're gonna do it right. And I was gonna have people lined up that I wanted to talk to, not being forced to talk to, and we could run it the way I wanted to run it. So we, my manager suggested, hey, can you do it earlier? Cause I've got some stuff for you to go on and I'd like you to be able to plug it. Well, I did all of those things and didn't plug it cause I'm a fucking idiot because I'm, I'm of the mindset that if people like me, they'll find me. And that's not how it should be. I'm getting better at promoting myself. That is one way. That is. I think it's just uh, your the angle of your trajectory right. may be slightly shallower. Yeah, and I like it. I want it to be a little more. I'd like to I'd like to shoot a fucking danger close round. Like that's what I would like it to be. I would like it to be fucking straight up barrel. I would like it to be as high and fast as it can because I, I'm finally in a stage psychologically where I'm ready for it and I can handle it. And now that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. So we started the Brass and Unity podcast in November last year. And we came out with some bangers. I mean... I'm pretty sure for if you look at my list of people for like the first 40 episodes, the fact that I've gotten half of those people is fucking ridiculous. I don't I don't question the fact that tits were involved. They saw the picture. They booked based on the picture. I don't care. It got them on the show, though. Yeah. And it worked. Don't really care. So I've had some people I've had, you know, Paul DeGelder who's lost a, a leg and an arm and a shark attack. He's the host of Shark Week. I've had Travis Pastrana, like yep. like insanely incredible human being. Um, that was a husband pull. Slash out of his fucking mind. He is not out of his mind. He is brilliant. Slash out of his fucking mind. Well, yeah, mind. but like out of his mind in like a good way. Yeah, I'm he's, not saying it negatively. Oh, okay. I thought you meant like just like he exists out. on a different plane of human he's a being. Different, he's a yes. different, <laughs> him and his wife, Lindsay, are different types of human yes. beings. Yeah, in like the most beautiful way though. Yeah, no, he's a savage in all of the best ways to say that. Uh, one of the best parenting, like parents I've ever seen. Like I, we we converse a lot about his kids and his wife and how they raise their children and because they're girls and just such an incredible conversation with him. We you know we've had that we've had I've had scientists on who create drugs and we've had conversations about COVID. I've had uh, I've had Navy SEALs. I've had Ray Cash Care on. Yep. I've been very fortunate to have him on. Um, I've got Steve uh, Eckert Eckert A C K E R T Eckert. Yeah, Eckert. I've got him coming on soon. Um, I've had I've had Bishop on. I've had Griff on. I've I'm hopefully going to have you on. I'll be gonna, on for okay, sure. Okay, great. Um, and I'm trying to build this group of people that are top tier people that have not only something to say because everybody has something to say. That's not true at all. Okay. Or some, some people just want to say what other people say. Well, that makes me sad inside for for them and like the people around them. There are many people out there that you should be sad inside for. Okay, well, then I'm gonna, I'll work on that. <laughs> I'm going to take what you said. I'm going to take it back. I'm going to work on that. All right, good. Yeah, so I try to, I like to have conversations with top tier people because I want to bring value to life and not just, because yeah. that's there's a lot of podcasts out there like that. Like I could talk about, you know, blah, 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 and blah, 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 and all these crazy things, but I would rather focus in on like every aspect of a conversation I have, there'll be a hint of mental health chat but there's not much there's enough for it to be like 
that's a takeaway. I want somebody to listen to it and go, that's a takeaway that I can use to improve my life some way, or at least a resource or something I didn't know about that somebody did to help themselves. And so that's why I kind of do what I do now, because I think the difference between me and maybe other people that do podcasts or, you know, try to do podcasts is I'm super violently open. Like I'll tell you all the deep dark secrets because I have no shame in them because I don't think there needs to be shame. And I think we're kind of seeing this change in perspective and how we handle mental health. And I mean, thank fucking God, but I think it's only yeah. brought on because society has started to be tested. So they're realizing that the psyche is a very fragile thing, but people just weren't dealing with it on a mass scale like they are now. I don't think the psyche has to be fragile. I don't either, but I think people are soft. People are soft. And I was going to say, you know, when you want to go be, be strong, what do you do? You pick up heavy shit. Right. But not just one session in the gym. Mm -hmm. It's a history of, I mean, we're, what you're really doing is you're pushing your muscles, right? You're breaking it down and you're slowly building back up in the hopes that it comes back slightly bigger and stronger. Get out and challenge yourself, people. They don't have to wait. And this one thing that I, that I hope that the pandemic provides for people is a more robust psyche. Right. I have my doubts as to whether or not it will go that way because if you can go into a pandemic or what we are working our way, hopefully through at the tail end, the better you are equipped going into it, the better are you probably gonna be through it and at the end of it. Right. So maybe don't wait until the next time that the world pushes on you to go and get into the mental gym. Go fucking push yourself well, and develop your psyche. Not just the mental gym. The fucking gym. That too. Just like maybe, maybe don't eat six donuts for breakfast every day and like a jug of coffee. Maybe put some fucking effort into your life so that when this shit does happen again. What's wrong with a jug of coffee? I'm well, going to cut you off right there. Okay. There's nothing wrong with a jug of coffee. It's the jug of coffee followed by the no water that day that I don't, I don't, I don't drive the with. The main ingredient in coffee is water. Okay. Listen here, Jesse Phillips. I don't want to have this fucking conversation about water again because I've done this on a podcast before. This guy told me what, do you know who Jesse Phillips is? No. Okay. Great Marine, super awesome, great human being, really great person. I'll tell you about him after. Anyway, he's got like a bajillion brothers and sisters that were all like Marines and they're all like Phillips and they're all great humans. And we had this conversation and I said to him, cause he drinks Red Bull like it's like it's nothing, like constant. I've never seen a bottle of water in this guy's hand. I'm like, you're six foot four. How are you surviving? He's like, I just don't drink water. I'm like, you're a bad person. He's like, why am I a bad person? I'm like, you're gonna die. You're, you're gonna drink only coffee and Red Bull and you're gonna straight up fucking die. And then you're gonna have like seven kids that are not gonna have a dad. And so I guilt him into drinking water on a regular basis. I also drink water. Yep. I'm just saying the main ingredient in coffee is also water. So it counts in my daily intake. So here's the thing. This is what I've been trying to do. So I have been, and I mean, hitting them up like it's going out of fucking style like to the point where like i'm annoying them where it's like if they get one more message from me or well, they probably go in the fucking ether like you, your dms do because you're who you are but i met which is absolutely nobody for clarity cool no we, i thought we knew this you're a gay porn star now not yet okay. aspiring okay well that's neither here nor there but that's yeah, who you let's are not now. put my name on the hollywood walk of fame just yet i is need there, to earn that is there a hollywood walk of fame for porn stars i guarantee you there is somewhere it's probably not in hollywood though. i wonder where it is because i want to find out i want to find out and then i'm gonna go and i'm, I'm gonna sure take a name play hall of fame somewhere for everything i'm so. gonna legitimately because i have this ability i'm gonna go get a piece like of stainless cut out and i'm gonna put your name and i'm gonna bring it and i'm gonna plaster it in I'm going to find out where this porn walk of fame is. And I would probably support that. You're immediately regretting having this succession. No, you? I'll okay. go there with you. We'll okay. celebrate it together. Okay. I'm already excited for this. So, yeah. so I, I literally like I've gotten on a plane before and sat beside the head of sales for black rifle, like just by fluke. And you know, you can, we can all tell who you guys are. I don't think you, if you've been in the military, I can tell a special operator. That's way, not true. Fuck you. It's not. It's not caught him like figured him out in 30 seconds figuring one person out in 30 seconds doesn't mean you can figure everybody out not We're everybody all different and unique special people it's special for sure yeah 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 i could tell though just by the way he was like sitting his movements and i said did you serve in the military and he goes yeah see that's his first mistake right there the answer is no no he well and then he had a black rifle shirt on i said you work for black rifle and he goes you know the internet is a place where you could also get a black rifle shirt without actually being so, an employee but wait it gets better and he just looks at me and he goes how did you know that I said, I feel like I've seen you before. And he goes, I'm not in any of their photos. I make sure they don't take any fucking photos of me. And he just let it out. Like, just <laughs> let it right out there. And I said, can I have your business card? And he goes, sure. So he gives me his business card. So I email him. Never email his back. Never email his back. So then I go. Because you embarrassed him publicly. Well, he hates you. Well, that's what happens then. Maybe don't give it away so easily. 
I mean, first off, here, here's the rookie move that he made when he said, when you said to him, hey, did you serve in the military? The answer is nope. <laughs> because then where do you go from there? Next question, please. <laughs> I say no all the time. Do you actually? Fuck yes, I do. Just so you don't have to be bothered. No, I'll go into, and again, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with people being incredibly proud about their service. I'm, I'm just talking about my perspective, but I'll go into like Home Depot and buy something. They'll say, hey, uh, did you ever serve in the military? I'm like, no. I have a Navy Federal uh, check card. I've had a Navy oh, Federal okay. account. And so I'll pay with it and they'll say, hey, did you serve in the military? And oftentimes they'll say, no, my dad did. I just, I don't, oh, I'm okay. not in, it's just, like I said, it's not going to be who I am. Or no. was for the rest of my life. I'm. It's just we've established that. Yeah, we've established who you're becoming. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Aspirationally. Right. And so I, <laughs> I got talking with him anyway. So I've I my like goal, my next goal, because I have some really great sponsors on my show already, and so I work with Good Fucking Design Advice. These guys are like the only one of the only published books to have a swear word on the cover, and they're published by Harper Collins. I mean, I mean, technically, it's not. Sh- no other one asterisk. has that. Asterisk. Yeah, but that asterisk doesn't exist normally. So I've been fortunate to work with them. They do stuff with Apple and Nike, and they just partnered with us to do um, our own copy, which we just put on a mug. Sweet. Yes, and I'm really proud of it because I've always loved them. I found out about them through my husband when he bought like one of their first posters that they made in their house. And they've I've just followed them. They've been great. And then we work with Combat Flip Flops. They sponsor the show as well. They've been really great. And then we have, um, so we've got Brass and Unity, we've got Combat Flip Flops, we've got Good Fucking Design Advice, and then we also have Beneath Underwear, which is a men's underwear company. I have a bunch. I was gonna bring you some too, but I don't have your size. I ran out. I'm a large. Are you, fuck, I thought you were gonna be a medium for sure. I was out of mediums, I had largest. I'll show you some, I got some. You know who's medium? Josh Bridges, because <laughs> he's a little bitch. Are you he's sure he's actually, not small? He's extra small, at best. At best. Oh yeah. I would doubt. I would He's got th- legs as skinny as these goddamn micro. How did right he here. even? How did he even survive? First off, Josh is like an absolute fucking stud. I love the dude. Um, he is like a high level CrossFit athlete for like the last decade. Oh, okay. Yeah, he could pick up probably this half of the continent if it wasn't attached <laughs> to the ground. No, he's he's the best. Uh, he's just incredibly tiny. Yeah. He's a pocket person. Yeah, he's like three eleven. He's like a Navy SEAL poly pocket. It's like, hey man. I need you. I just saw a cat go down that little into the hole. You're about that size. I need you to get in there. Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, sweet. I'll have plenty of room. I'll rattle around in there like a hot dog being thrown down a hallway. It's like. Good analogy. Yeah. It's good. I mean, some people will get it. It's one of my faves. I got it. (laughs) I've gotten it. Um, We should talk about your book because this book is obviously awesome. It will live on the podcast table. Thank you. But your book. Yeah. When did you start writing it? I wrote it two years ago, but it's in a lot of development changes right now because we've got three separate publishers wanting it. And it's not out yet. Not out yet. October, I believe, is what I saw. Could be even a little little later because there's another project attached to it now. Okay. Like a, a little bit of a bigger project. Cool. We can talk about that offline. But if people, yeah. uh, uh, Brass and Unity. Everything is, literally yeah. everything I do is Brass and Unity. Not, everything. Not a bad strategy, actually. <laughs> See, people were like, you should diversify. You should call it a different name. And I'm like, well, when you Google Brass and Unity, what the fuck do you want to pop up? Well, there's probably value in diversifying, but there is a lot of time wasted managing four fucking websites and all of the other things, right. as opposed to having this boom umbrella and all your stuff is right there. Right. Yeah. So for people who are going to want to get your book, which uh, the is way it talks would be the description of who you are, where you came from, what you went through, things we've talked about. Yep. Can they even pre-order it yet? No. Okay. Well, but here's shit. the thing. When but, no, but, gonna- but here's the thing. They're not, hmm, trust me, they're going to be fine. It's going to be fucking everywhere. It'll be fine. They'll find it. They'll get it on Amazon. They'll be able to get it in Barnes & Noble. They'll be able to get it in Chapters. They'll be able to get it on my website. But late this year at best. We're hoping, yes. Okay. But Potentially next year, early? Well, potentially next year because there's other projects that okay. are like take a little longer to like film. Okay. We will leave those mm-hmm. as unspoken because uh-huh. we'll let those deals ink themselves because then you're going to like welcome me back and i'm gonna fly down again yeah of course and then we're gonna go to that freaking ridiculous restaurant we just went to which was soto holy shit did you have the cornbread no because i don't do cornbread because i've never really had it like get the fuck out i can't All right, you're not actually living your life properly unless you have i had cornbread. a brisket sandwich and that that'll blow your eyebrows off their it, brisket sandwich he had mac and cheese with it which which mac and cheese did you have there's four options just the regular one 
fuck is wrong well, with because you? Well, because I knew I had get to out. I had to sit here and I was like, I'm either gonna go into a fucking because I'm lactose intolerant, I'm yeah. either gonna go into a fucking coma or I'm gonna shit my pants on your show. So you can pick which one you want. You could do both, I guess. That'd be pretty interesting. Well, episode, here's the thing, it slides out the bottom, grab the bottom, pull it out, you'll be fine. Look well, I know I was gonna say Yeah. They can't find your book right now, but, but they, there are so many things. things that you can find. It's not sliding out. I don't okay. know if I'm strong enough. Because you, you just broke the fucking packaging. I didn't. You said pull it down. Pull so. the white piece out. The white piece is out. You're, God, you're <laughs> such a man. It's so painful. So what we do is um, when we first started, it was we used to recycle old casings, turn them into jewelry. Now we manufacture our casings and we turn them into pieces for men and women. And we put sunglasses. I'm going to grab a pair because I've got them here. Yep. Um, so we actually take them and... We not only are the only ones that can put bullets in sunglasses and on jewelry and shit like that, because I own the patents and I'll fucking sue you, but we protect our shit. So every time you get a piece from Brass and Unity, whether any of it, doesn't matter, we donate 20% of it. Goes right to an organization. If you donate, sorry, these ones are scratched because they're Brady's, but. Sorry, show me where the bullets are on those things. On the temples. Oh, sweet. I've got you a pair of other ones, don't worry. Um, Just say no, I'll wear the fuck out of those driving my car. Okay. All right. Well, I'm the, comfortable I'll, with who I am. I'm. I'm. Well, <laughs> fuck. It'll be fine. Don't worry. You'll love them. Anyway, so we put bullets in the temples because um, we're trying to upgrade people's temples here, and um, we donate the money. And so we work with these organizations and we do partnerships with them, and we either do a product with them or we just straight donate to them. And I'm when I say I don't, I don't just donate my money to anyone. Like I'm on either on boards of these places or I'm yep. an advisor of these places. I was going to ask you how you choose where to donate the I'm money. I'm picky. Well, here's the thing. Let's be really honest about the charitable charitable giving world and the ecosystem of It's a nightmare. It's a fucking minefield. Yeah, it is. There are there's two camps and oftentimes they collide. I'm, and I'm going to there's obviously the legitimate organizations and individuals, but I have right. found in my limited exposure to it, there are some organizations that are there to not really give to give six-figure salaries to the people that run them. Correct. And then there are also though People who have become ingrained to having their hand out. Oh, yes. It's a minefield on both sides. And yep. oftentimes those organizations and individuals will meet. So I caution people when it comes to wanting to give to military charities. Uh, the last statistic I heard, there's 40,000 service-based organizations right. in the United States. That's a lot, that's a lot of choices. Mm -hmm. Do your research because there's nothing worse than thinking that you're making a difference, but what you're actually doing is making a car payment for somebody. And that's exactly what happened. So that's why when I started this, I decided that I was going to start with a handful of charities and just work my way with them because there is only so much money to give and you want to give it to the people that are really making the impact. So for example, Honor House, it's yep. in Canada. That's one of our Canadian ones. They were started by Aldi Genova because of a soldier named Trevor Green. People know of him. That is a motherfucker you need to talk to. Okay. Holy shit. He got an ax in his head in 2007. He still survived. Like in prayer circle, helmet off, fucking hacks, axe right in the middle. Survived. He's um, He does the Invictus games with Prince Harry. And um, he's uh, in a wheelchair. He rocks an exoskeleton, though. He's a brilliant human being. Honor House was started because somebody heard his story. So Al Genova heard his story, and he's a lieutenant colonel. And he is uh, retired artillery. And he goes, I want to start this facility. So picture Ronald McDonald for first responders and military and for their families. I like this. It's giant. They just opened another one up in Ashcroft. It's 140 acres. It's got 10 cabins on it. PTSD, therapy, everything's paid for. When you go there, if you have a funeral that's not even military related, nothing, your whole family stays there for free. They're unfucking believable human beings. I've been on their board, seen their books. They have one paid employee. Everybody else on that board and that works there, that maintains it, that does the grass cutting to the fucking blinds, volunteer base. Yep. They're insane with what they do. They have their own honor house bracelet with us. All their proceeds go to them. We work with other people like um, we're just starting with uh, Children of Fallen Patriots out of D.C. They've got like an operating budget of like 10 million and they give kids, even if they um, are in utero and the father or mother dies, you're schooling, you're everything everything follows and paid for it's fucking fantastic work they do and so we work with all these different smaller organizations that not only reach out but stay with the people they care about the people whether whether they're with them and, and like looking after them for a temporary amount of time or if they've gone off and then they come back and are like hey i still need some more support okay no problem like they they really they don't just be like here here's this see you later 
you know, yeah. and benefit you there. So we do work with them. Vets Canada, that's a big one. But the thing about how our brand works is because we ship internationally, we ship all over the world. If the United States, people buy it in the States and it gets shipped to a United States address, that money stays in the United States for U.S. veterans. So all your sales from MCX, like Marine Corps Exchange, yep. stays in the States. AFIS stays in the States. Online, if your address is anywhere, stays in the States. Yep. Same with Canada, Europe, Australia, and otherwise. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's even. So nobody can be like, you're giving more to the Americans or you're giving more to the Canadians. It's well, like, you're I'm, actually not the one deciding where it goes. I'm not. It, it's, it's who buys it. That's how it's decided. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice. That keeps your hands clean out of that process, too. Well, it's fair. I Because otherwise you'd get some nagging Nellies, as we call them down here. Nagging Nellies? We call them Karens. We call them that, too, or bitch asses. Bitch asses. <laughs> <laughs> bitch ass shit pumps. That's what they are. What a, it's true. I mean, what the hell are you going to do next? You've already got an awesome company. Thank you. You've already got the book. Yep. Which will lead to other things, I am sure. You've already got the podcast. Yep. I mean, what's next? You're going to design a fucking autonomous driving vehicle that also is a submarine i mean what do you got going i'm not as cool as elon musk but i did just get a tesla so i kind of feel that cool do you like it i got in a car accident a couple months ago that was that i've never been in something that gnarly before yeah. and so i went from a range rover that saved me quite well um and when i read the statistics of these the testing of vehicles and every vehicle that's ever been tested in all of time and the only one top five are tesla I'm just taking one of those. What do you think about it? Um, well, so mine's not here yet, yeah. but my husband's is. Um, so I've driven the X, I've driven the Y. I've I just haven't driven the car. So I've had the bigger SUV, I've had the smaller SUV, I just haven't tried the car. They're fucking so fun to drive. I've only driven one, and it was relatively early on when they came out. It was awesome. Try again. Well, I, I enjoyed that experience, and... I've ridden them a few times. They're a little bit of a novelty here, to be honest. Oh, yeah. We we walked around and we were laughing because we were going to actually drive like down if we could, if they let us through. It would have been bad. That, I don't know if it would have been that bad. Like there's a Tesla charging station in town. Oh, we were. I was I was wondering about that because I was like, I don't think there's even a Tesla charging there, station. There right. is. Huh. It's just always got spots available. But, if you th <laughs> but think about where you live. I, you know, to be honest, it's, I'm not against it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just, like I said, it's a little bit of a novelty. I'm a little yeah. bit more of a truck guy as it is. So. I grew up on trucks. Yeah. I, grew, I grew up on big SUVs and trucks. My parents are long haul truck drivers. I learned how to drive on an F-150. That That's my comfort zone is big vehicles. I feel safe in them. So the, the I had the Range Rover Velar before. Um, and that was a big, a bigger SUV. And it was fantastic. Um, but where we live, I didn't need a truck anymore. Like yeah. we stopped. It can become a pain in the ass if you're in the wrong spot. Yeah, well, we stopped racing. Like he stopped when he retired from Supercross. My husband, um, he owns a company called Atlas. It's a neck brace company and it saves your cervical spine. It's the safest neck brace in the world. And it is by far one of the best products out there if you wear a full face helmet for like motocross and supercross. So you, you know about marketing. That's what I'm talking about. But I about. can do it better for him, but I can't do it for me, it seems like. that's a, I, I struggle with it myself as right? well. I'm my worst personal promoter i get listen i went on good morning america last year they bumped this is gonna piss people off they bumped a u.s vet for me on veterans day and put me on um don't be mad I'm and mad. i did this interview and i didn't mention the podcast once and then the week later i went on carson daly's show yep the new mind matter show he like picked me out of a group after interviewing like people like logic which was fucking ridiculous and we sat and talked we we're supposed to talk for half an hour it went for like an hour and something and um, they cut it down. And I didn't say like anything. Yeah, those are always the moments where when you leave, you go, fuck. God damn it. <laughs> Come on. Hey, would you mind putting in the show notes uh, all these websites that oh, I neglected to mention? <laughs> exactly. So I'm getting better, but I, I, I try to be... I try to do it in a way because I, I really, truly am like this. This company isn't like a company to me. It's like my identity yep. and it's my it's my everything and so i've had people recently reach out to us that um i just never thought like when i first started it um kevin hart met with me and gave us a good piece of advice when i gave him some jewelry my mom was his driver on the what now tour okay and she would fucking harass his ass at the end of every show you need to meet my daughter you need to meet my daughter and so he was like fine i'll, I'll meet your fucking daughter <laughs> so we met him in vancouver and he was like, you know, at the time it was a different name because I was still building it. Yep. And then like a year later we were on Ellen. And then like a year later after that, we had like a list of celebrities. And I'm like sitting here like, I've got all of these people. I don't like talk about it. And now I'm starting to because at first I didn't know if I could even handle running a company. Honestly. Yeah. Psychologically. I didn't know what I could cope with, truthfully. And then we had our son 
And so I was like, and I got bad postpartum. And so I was like, I don't know what this is gonna be. It's a lot. It was a lot. And so now I'm at the point where I try to talk about it, but I try to talk about it in a way that people, uh, believe me is the wrong way. This is my fucking mission in life now. I had that mission I had before. This is my goddamn everything. Yeah. So even though there's spinoffs, the company is just the vehicle to put the money in the hands of the people that are doing the work. I'm just facilitating somebody's help. That's it. I'm giving you something instead of getting a tax receipt, I'm giving you something for it. And so I try to really think of it that way. And that's why I think it's been successful is because people see it like that. I'm not doing this to make money. I've never paid myself once. My goal is to donate a million dollars. Once I hit that, I'll give myself a small... Yeah. Very small paycheck. I don't think you're going to have an issue hitting a million dollars. I think you'll That's be my just goal. fine. That's my goal. Well, what's the next, though? I mean, you have all of this stuff so, as the foundation. What do you have your eyes on in the future? Um, what I would like to do eventually, and my goal is to have the couple projects that are going to come out. I'd like to start my own foundation and really pour the money into that and start doing outreach on, in a different way. I'd like to start looking at things like um, psychedelics for healing. So like heroic hearts, I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I have heard of them, Jesse, don't know much about them. So Jesse Gould, uh, he was a ranger, mm -hmm. he started it. Fucking phenomenal human being. Um, they they take people to Peru and they take you to the Shipibo tribe and they sit there and you, and you sit in the medicine with them and they make you feel welcome. Like when I went and did ayahuasca, I went with heroic hearts. Mm -hmm. I went with a group of guys who were special ops guys and me and so i got this opportunity to do something differently and so my goal is to continue to help in a on a bigger scale while doing it and not changing who the fuck i am so the podcast is not going to change i'm not going to stop swearing i'm not going to stop doing what i do i'm not going to stop having guests on that people maybe not like if i want to talk to you i'm going to fucking talk to you and if i think you have something to say i'm going to do it and so i want to grow the podcast exponentially because i enjoy the podcast it's therapy to me yeah. and so if it helps i'm gonna do it so i want to grow the company i want to start the foundation plug all that money from the company into the foundation start doing the hard work there start partnering with people like hopefully i'd love to partner with people like heroic hearts one day start really doing this research and then have you know at the end of the day have have time to get on my road bike every day and do what i need to do for my head right so i know i'm putting my head down right now i'm trucking along i'm 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 focused as fuck and i'm i'm trying to get these projects going and done and get our name out there because at the end of the day i'm still from a small town in canada that most people have never heard of and a brand that a lot of people haven't heard of even though i've been on ellen and i've been on kevin hart and julian huff and michael buble and all these fucking people but they don't know the story behind why i do what i do and why i am so violently passionate when i go to a trade show i make people cry on my podcast it is like a it's I kind of a dick move. But it is. Grown men that look like you weep on my fucking show, and I love it. Because what I, the fuck does it have to do with looking like me? Because you're a bigger dude who I'm doesn't look like I could crack. I'm absolutely average fucking size. You're not. And trust me, you couldn't crack me. That's funny, because every person who said that to me has cracked. Bring it. And there have been plenty of them like you, too. All right. Fair okay. enough. But that's what I'm saying. We're not all the same. Listen, Despite what some people you're not the in same. this room, who not, I'm not to name names, but it's not me or your husband, have said. I didn't say that. I didn't say you're all the same. I'm saying you're all cool in the same way. No, you actually said was we were walking up the stairs <laughs> precisely calling me that out. we are all the same. You're the same in the sense that you're all high level functioning human beings. That's that, not true. It's true. No, well, okay. No. You're, the people there I've met. There are people met, in the community who are missing chromosomes. The people that I have had the privilege to have met and be and sit in ceremony with and stay in touch with and involve in my life, in my circle, have all seemed to be, I know that fucking face you're doing because I know why you're fucking I'm gonna doing it. I'm going to make some intros for you. Oh. I'll fucking change that perception right now. Okay. Well, I want to <laughs> see this change then. I want to see this fucking change. This Mr. Andy who knows everybody. No, I'm saying I know some shit pumps. Okay, well. See what I did there? I took your word oh, yes. and I made it mine. I'm so glad that the takeaway from this is you got a new <laughs> piece of vocabulary because normally the vocabulary issue is, is all on me. So, but yes, we are trying. We are trying to stop. I just don't want veterans to ever think that suicide is or can be the option or has to be yeah. the option. And so for me, that is my mission with Brass and Unity. Bravery, retired, assistant soldier support, and unifying the public with that. That's the best end actually ever. I was just going to say I'd stuff. give you the closing thoughts, but you actually just nailed it. I think all I can really do is thank you guys for your time, for coming up here, and let's definitely make this round one of fill in the blank. I'm always here. Let me cool. know. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Okay, one, two,
in from the north. I've got the west bank of the river. Two's going to give it to you in the grove. Roger, give me that gun run. Wait right along that bad, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to tune in, whether you're listening on an audio-only platform or you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate that you take the time every week to tune in. People ask me a lot, what can they do to help me spread the word? And the answer is actually embedded in the question. The biggest thing you guys can do to help me if you enjoy the podcast and you think it would be helpful to others is subscribe and share it with other people. And if you have the time, go on to Apple Podcasts and leave me a rating and a review. If you think the podcast sucks, tell me it sucks and leave a zero star review or the lowest stars possible. If you have a question, comment or suggestion, you can go to clearedhotpodcast.com and there is a contact me button right there, which will land in my inbox. And the last thing, if people are interested in helping out, what you can do is fly the old flag. And by that, I don't mean an actual flag because I don't have any of those. I'm talking about t-shirts or sweatshirts or hats, whatever it may be. Again, clearedhotpodcast.com. Click on the shop tab and hopefully something in there looks like it would be an item you would like to wear around town. And then you could tell people what it is when they ask you. But that is it. The biggest thing I can say is thank you. I truly appreciate it. Until next time. See you.